and also Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Councilor Nardia Simpson. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Magandang umaga. You say magandang umaga. Uh, good. <laughs> good children. Uh, as we celebrate our anniversary, we rekindle memories. We set aside the date in order to reflect and be grateful for the 40 years of hard work and hard work committed by the staff. So it's time for nostalgic uh, moments. Uh, to start our program, may I invite everybody to please rise uh, for the recitation of the invocation by Anna, uh, how do you pronounce your name? Anna Spigol. Uh, and sing with her the national anthem. Anna. Let us place our loving. Uh, let us place ourselves in the loving presence of God.
to be understood as to understand to be Let's place our right hand to our chest and let us sing with remembrance and history our the Philippine national anthem. Mayang magiliw perlas ng silanganan alab ng puso Sa ditim mo'y buhay, lupang hinirang, duyan ka ng magiting. Sa manlulupig, di ka ba sisiil? Sa dagat at bundok, sa simoyan, sa langit mong mata, may dilagang tula at awit sa panglayang minamahal. Ang kislap ng wataw at mo'y tagong. Na nagliligling ang bituin at araw niyang kailan pa may di magdidilim lupa ng araw ng wal ating pagsinta. Thank you, Anna. Uh, to welcome us all is someone whose mobility is not hampered by the demands of a husband and children. Kasi <laughs> miss So uh, may we may we call on Doctor Elda Esquera to be the to give the welcome remarks. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Asusena. You know, whenever I am introduced to trainings or any gathering, they always they do not forget the word that I am still single. That is why she, she told, and we are many in post harvest. <laughs> I will not I will not tell who are they. <laughs> so a pleasant uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and gracing the uh, 40th anniversary symposium of uh, PHTRC. Of course, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our honorable guests, uh, Senator Cynthia Villar, the chair of the Senate Committee on Agriculture, uh, Ms. Narja Simpson, the economic counselor of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of, our, of Australia, uh, our UPLB officials led by uh, Vice Chancellor Crisanto Dorado, the Dean of the College of Agriculture, uh, Dean uh, Supanko, uh, our mentors and our pillars, our elders, not elderly, elders <laughs> of uh, Post Harvest, our project collaborators uh, the, from the private sector, the farmers, the uh, traders, uh, and of course, our providers of funds, 
uh, the uh, DA, the uh, Bureau of Agricultural uh, Research, uh, the DOST, uh, Picard, uh, and then uh, the international partners like uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Rural Development Administration of Korea, uh, the director is here, the director of the Post Harvest uh, Center uh, in Asia, uh, and then, uh, of course, our uh, partners in HR, our longtime uh, collaborators and uh, other uh, funding agencies, uh, other guests, and of course, the whole uh, PHTRC family. It has been four decades since the PHTRC was established. Uh, this is in response to the United Nations General Assembly Resolution of Reducing Post-Harvest Losses. Uh, we were an ASEAN uh, center for about eight years that started in 1977 and after fulfilling the mandates uh, for the ASEAN re region, uh, PHTRC decided to focus or to cater to the needs of the uh, Philippine horticulture industry and of course while still continuing the uh, requests from other uh, institutions, other countries, not only from ASEAN, but also from Asia and even uh, up to Africa. We have uh, conducted trainings uh, and we have been conducting those uh, activities for more than 30 years. So in our pursuit of uh, a globally competitive horticultural industry uh, through post-service systems improvement, we uh, commit to uh, continue generating basic information that serves as basis for technology uh, generation and modifying technologies and uh, building capacities of uh, the different stakeholders in the supply chain. So uh, today's event, uh, the theme is very relevant that is on post-service research and extension. So we are gathered here to discuss the current issues and challenges facing the post-harvest uh, horticulture industry and the research and development needs. No? So we focus our symposium on industry partners' perspectives. That is why this afternoon, most of our speakers are from the industry and uh, the whole, uh, along the whole value chain. And uh, that includes also the uh, uh, capacity building and international uh, partnerships and linkages. But we cannot do it alone. No, PHTRC cannot do it alone. So we need partners to fulfill our mission. Hence, uh, we hope to uh, identify opportunities for further collaboration and co-innovation for the advancement of the horticultural industry uh, in the country. So we all count on you in jointly uh, working with us to reduce uh, post-harvest losses, maintain quality, uh, assure safety of the consumers, and increase the value of horticultural perishables along the chain. So uh, here are the, uh, for us, uh, here's a fruitful uh, symposium and uh, celebration. We are deeply grateful to everyone for again for coming here and gracing this momentous occasion, 40 years. So that's all and mabuhay. Thank you, Elda. Uh, we are missing the presence of our chancellor who has a previous appointment, but he uh, sent someone to represent him. Uh, we are calling on Dr. Crisanto Dorado, the Vice Chancellor for Administration. Uh, good morning. I'm truly delighted to be with all of you here to celebrate 40 stellar years of PHTRC. Uh, by the way, I'm one of those who are hampered with a wife and two kids, uh, like <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Esguera here. Uh, on behalf of the Chancellor of uh, UPLB, uh, Dr. Fernando Sanchez Jr., allow me to share his message to you all on this momentous occasion. 
Uh, to the Honorable Cynthia Villar, uh, Senator and Chair of the Senate Committee on Agriculture. To Ms. Narja Simpson, Economic Counselor, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australian Embassy in the Philippines. To the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, Dr. Enrico Sopango. And to the Director of the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, Dr. Elda S. Guerra. To our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. And happy 40th anniversary to the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center. For the past four decades, the PHTRC has been a trusted and internationally recognized institution that continues to provide various services and assistance to our country's agricultural industry. Since its establishment in 1977 through the ASEAN Australian Economic Cooperation Program, PHTRC has grown extensively, complete with new facilities as well as current and responsive R&D programs that continue to address post-harvest food losses. And by the way, if you need new facilities, I suggest you might request the Chancellor for additional funding. <laughs> Tell him I told you so. As the center reaches its 40th year of glorious existence, I'm confident that the PHTRC will continue to pursue even greater heights and successfully accomplish its goals. With its team advancing the horticulture industry to post-harvest research and extension, PHTRC's 40th anniversary underscores the fundamental role of extension in advancing and effectively disseminating for post-harvest technologies protocols, and processes to its stakeholders. This also in many ways mirrors UPLB's mandate, which is to ensure that the university's numerous developed technologies are used by its intended stakeholders. Now, today's event seeks to further strengthen UPLB's ties with its stakeholders, from the horticulture industry through a dialogue. As we come together to find ways to further help one another and advance our mutual interests, to aid us in accomplishing this endeavor, we shall have panel and plenary presentations from industry stakeholders, both from the private and public sector. We shall also have a symposium afterwards. We hope that through this, we can have a platform to which our experience and ideas can be shared and discussed. We also hope that through today's event, all of us will not only get a better picture of the industry at present, but also pave the way for future collaborations with one another. Collaborations that will be beneficial. Oops. Uh, sorry for the technical defect. <laughs> Concerned stakeholders as well as the industry as a whole. Thus I encourage everyone to actively participate in today's discussions and dialogues through open communication and cooperation I'm confident that we can commence a new era for the industry, making it stronger, more robust, and more responsive to the needs of our nation. Once again, happy anniversary to the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, and I wish everyone an insightful and fruitful gathering. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Salamat po. Magbibigay din kayo ng budget. <laughs> oh, daw. Oh. Okay. Uh, the center was <laughs> built and equipped by the Australian government, and we are very thankful for that. And this was given to us through the Asian Australian Economic Cooperation Program. Uh, we are missing the ambassador to the Philippines, but he sa she sent someone uh, who is the counselor, uh, economic counselor of the Australian Embassy. Uh, are you hampered by the demands of a husband? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, Ms. Sam Simpson holds a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws 
from the University of South Wales. Uh, she, has, she has been a legal advisor for many years and before joining the USAID, uh, Ms. Simpson worked, Mrs. Simpson worked in India as a legal advisor on public-private partnership. Uh, she also went to Afghanistan. That time it was not a war-torn country yet. Uh, within the USAID, and later the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Ms. Simpson worked in the, on the Pacific Regional Program in the Office of Minister for Foreign Affairs and as the Executive Officer of the Director General of, of Aid. Please welcome Ms. Nardia Simpson. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. I am encumbered with a husband and, and um, daughter, but one of, the, one of the good things about that um, is that my husband actually works a lot in, previously worked a lot in agriculture in India, so I managed to travel to a lot of very remote communities in the mountains of India and look at their post-harvest um, techniques there. So coming here today, uh, it was supposed to be our Deputy Ambassador, Mr. Matt Kimberley. You might have seen his picture. Um, down the road, but um, unfortunately he couldn't make it. But as I say, his loss is my gain because I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I think this is, it's as, as an Australian, you know, we, we hear a lot about our aid program and, um, and with that we, uh, you, often w you often wonder, you know, what happened years ago to all these, um, the money that was invested and this is just, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. So, um, but now I'll move on to the formal speech. Um, so. Uh, Honourable Cynthia Villar, Sec Senator and Committee Chair for Agriculture and Food and Agrarian Reform. Dr. Cristiano Dorado, Vice-Chancellor for Administration on, of UP Los Banos. Dr. Esquera, Director of the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Centre. Dr. Enrico P. Supanco, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Food Science. Dr. Rinaldo Ebora, Direct Executive of Picard. Development Partners from the Asia Post-Harvest Research Centre, Food and Agricultural Organisation, representatives from local government and civil society, officials and representatives of the private sector, and officials and staff of the Post-Harvest Training and, Cent and Research Centre, my colleagues from the Australian Embassy here, and ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here today to join you in celebrating the Centre's four decades of leadership in post-harvest research and development. Congratulations to Director Esquera and to the hardworking women and men of the Centre for, re for reaching another milestone. Just yesterday, uh, my, who's, who's the ACR representative from the Australian Government here, we're talking about the importance of promoting women in science. So it's just wonderful to, to be here and see so, meet so many inspirational women. And I'm very pleased that the Philippines and Australia has this strong partnership in post-harvest research and development a partnership that started some 40 years ago with the establishment of this facility under the ASEAN Australia Economic Cooperation Program with a funding grant and which we continue to maintain through our research work led by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research which our Foreign Minister Julie Bishop has described as the jewel in the crown of Australia's international aid program. Our aid program is working with the Philippines government to promote prosperity, reduce poverty and enhance stability. In agriculture, we're helping respond to the agricultural research and development priorities of the Philippines through ACIA's research for development initiatives. ACIA's support focuses on increasing productivity, marketability and international competitiveness for agricultural products and with a focus also on reducing the adverse effects of climate change on the rural poor something that we just learnt about this morning when planting the rambutan trees. I understand that the, the season for rambutan has actually changed already. Globally, the agriculture and natural resource sector is faced with the continuous challenges to produce more food with less land, water, nutrients and energy resources, while conserving biodiversity and sustaining livelihood, and to adapt to a changing climate and to be resilient to disasters, amongst many other things. 
these issues are even more pressing and relevant in the Philippines. Underpinning these two priorities is the need for more effective extension processes and greater responsiveness to market opportunities. This includes improving post-harvest options and practices of smallholder farmers and traders in the horticultural sector, specifically for high-value fruit and vegetables. The Philippines Development Plan notes that among the long-standing challenges that continue to hamper agricultural productivity is post-harvest losses. Various studies by research institutions, including the Centre, put post-harvest loss in rice production at 16%, 8% for corn, and a su surprising statistic for me was that as much as 30 to 45% for fruits and vegetables. Inadequate facilities in production areas, lack of access of farmers to these services, and knowledge gaps of farmers on how to make best use of post-harvest technologies are some of the contributing factors that compound the problem. The losses pres present staggering numbers and if addressed can make a positive impact not only on increasing incomes of farmers but also to improve food security in the Philippines. This is where targeted agricultural research for development in post-harvest handling becomes even more important in creating new opportunities for agriculture and agri-food systems. In close collaboration with the Philippines Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources for Research and Development, Picard, ACR is currently implementing the Southern Philippines Fruit and Vegetable Program. With a total funding grant of approximately Australian, Australian dollars 12 million, which is roughly uh, 480 million Philippine pesos, uh, the program aims to improve smallholder and industry profitability and marketing, market competitiveness of select f vegetable industries, including potato, tomato, bell peppers and leafy vegetables and to identify and implement improvements to domestic and export value chains for tropical fruits, such as mango, papaya, durian, banana, and jackfruit. The program is doing this through targeted research interventions in policy and regulatory analysis, production, disease and pest management, and post-harvest handling, which is assessing ways to reduce losses in the product volume and quality of selected fruits and vegetables. I'm happy to see that UP Los Banos and the Centre is one of, one of the implementing partners of the program, together with Australian and Philippine universities and research organisations. Beyond the construction of this facility so many years ago, I'm glad that Australia's assistance has helped the Centre to train a pool of researchers and extension workers in, the ASEAN, in ASEAN who trailblaze post-harvest research and development in their respective countries support ASEAN research projects that are in the production of books, in the post-harvest handling of rambutan, durian and mango, deliver in partnership with ASEA projects that have resulted in improvement of the post-harvest handling systems for banana, mango and papaya, and the quality assurances of fresh cuts, and to allow a number of key staff members who are able to visit Australia for training and mentoring with partner university and research institutions forging strong personal and professional linkages. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about. As economic counsellor, I also look after our Australia Awards program, which is at the moment is, is having a, an increased focus on short courses. And so that's something that, that, uh, uh, that Maya and I will be talking about in the future. I hope that you'll continue using and improving the knowledge products and technologies generated from the research and disseminate the information to smallholder farmers farmer groups and traders so that they can gain access to livelihood and income opportunities. Post-harvest problems in the agriculture sector is a daunting task, a task one centre or agency cannot solve alone. Like any development challenge, it takes collective effort and commitment. I encourage everyone here to actively participate in the discussions later in the day and to be generous in sharing your expertise and field experience in finding science-based solutions to the post-harvest challenges our Philippine farmers face. And again, congratulations to the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Centre for this wonderful anniversary. Thank you and good morning. Thank you. Um, before I turn over the mic to Alan, uh, as we reflect on the years gone by, we also commend those who led in shaping the center into what it is today. Uh, may I start with Dr. Ernesto Fantastico, the first director. He led the foundation of the center. Wala siya. Hampered by... Hindi pala. 
hindi pala. <laughs> and then Dr. Ophelia Bautista. Uh, she uh, advocates, advocated, advocates the village level post harvest handling of vegetables. And then we miss Dr. Uh, Dorotea Men Mendoza, who just passed away last month. And then Dr. Maria Concepcion Lizada. <laughs> not hampered then by husband. <laughs> uh, she developed the ethylene scrubber to delay the ripening of fruits and vegetables, patented John, and the control, uh, and control the atmosphere. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Indralino Suriano. Serrano. Uh, Hampered by the, the travel. <laughs> okay. And then the younger ones. Kasi yung unang binanggit ko, mga older siyang. Uh, no, these are the directors. Uh, Dr. Perlita Nuevo Aquino Nuevo. Uh, of course, Dr. Esguera, uh, Dr. Joy Agravante. Yeah. Pabata ng pabata ang mga director. Okay naman. Okay, so also I would like to acknowledge the presence of our guest. Uh, we have Dr. Dr. Jocelyn Eusebio the director of Picard, uh, chief, the chief science research specialist of Filmec, Miriam Akda. Also the deputy director of Filmec, Raul Paz. We have the assistant, we have an assistant professor of the Institute of Agricultural Engineering uh, engineer Rina Bawar. And then we have the manager of the Alter Trade, Ray Terefrancia. And the vice president for academic affairs of the PL. Untin Lupa, Dr. Teresita Fortuna. Thank you. Uh, now, Arlan, your. <laughs> oh, and Dr. Kisumbing, sorry. Yeah. Fresh from the US. He flew in just to attend the, <laughs> the center's. Uh, Anniversary, tama. Uh, may dalad siyang dolyares. <laughs> Alan. Thank you, Mom Cora. At this point, we would like to invite our guests of honor for a photo session together with our highly esteemed speakers. So, our speakers, please, at the back. Uh, Dr. Rosaro. Dr. Ji Gang Kim, Dr. Connie Lizada, okay. former directors of PHTRC, Mom um, Cynthia De Gia, Ms. Hilda Caduya from Alta Trade, Mr. Ramon Manansala, and Mr. Wilfredo Alfonso. Director Ebora, Dr. Labios,
status. Mabilis na po. All right, so PHTRC is indeed the trailblazer in the field of post-harvest research and extension, not only in the Philippines, but also in the ASEAN region. As a primer to Dr. Esguera's talk on the status of post-harvest research and extension in the country, we would like to present to you first the PHTRC story. Southeast Asia is predominantly agricultural, but increased production of horticulture crops has not been adequate to meet demand. The main cause is high post-harvest loss. A Philippine survey on selected fruits and vegetables showed that post-harvest losses ranged from 32 to 78 percent or even higher under unfavorable circumstances such as typhoons and delayed shipment. Post-harvest handling system is the weakest link in the production marketing chain for fresh produce. High post-harvest losses mean less available food and reduced income for farmers and traders. The time, resources, and labor used for production are also wasted. If losses are reduced by 10%, the country could save millions of pesos per year. Thus, in 1977, Australia and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, through their economic operation program, decided to respond to the United Nations call for a reduction of post-harvest losses as a strategy to meet mankind's food requirements in developing countries. The Australian government provided the funds for the establishment of post-harvest laboratories in ASEAN with an ASEAN center in the Philippines. The mission of the ASEAN Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, or ASEAN PHTRC, was to train the core post-harvest staff of the ASEAN member states then. The initial core staff of the ASEAN PHTRC came from the Department of Horticulture of the College of Agriculture of the University of the Philippines Los Baños, or UPLB. Auxiliary staff were tapped from other units of the university and government agencies. Visiting scientists also assisted in conducting the program. From 1978 to 1985, the ASEAN PHTRC established a nucleus of post-harvest researchers in ASEAN. It also conducted eight ASEAN regional seminars and three international symposia on post-harvest handling during the same period, aside from many seminars and fora in the Philippines. From 1977 to 1985, it trained 1,803 post-harvest extension workers and researchers from ASEAN countries and also enhanced the capabilities of existing post-harvest staff from around 22 countries around the world. In 1985, it fulfilled its mandate of training core post-harvest specialists so the PHTRC ceased to be an ASEAN center. It was turned over to the Philippine government to become the National Center for Post-Harvest Handling of Perishable Crops. The present PHTRC without the ASEAN is known simply as PHTRC. Its vision is to be the center of academic and technological excellence on post-harvest science of tropical horticultural crops in the ASEAN region that is internationally connected and industry-oriented. Its mission is to modernize and enhance the global competitiveness of the Philippine horticulture industry through post-harvest systems development and improvement. The center is guided by its three major mandates. Most post-harvest basic researches in the country are done at PHTRC. It covers morphoanatomy, biochemistry, pathology and entomology, post-harvest physiology, biotechnology, Engineering studies conducted in collaboration with the Agricultural and Bioprocessing Division of the Institute of Agricultural Engineering, UPLB, and socioeconomics. These basic researches have led to the development of technologies. 
Flotation technique was developed to determine the right maturity of mango because immature fruits deteriorate fast and are more susceptible to physiological disorders. Coating pineapples with the wax emulsion developed by PHTRC reduces chilling injury of pineapple and enables it to be stored below its optimum temperature so it can be transported to more distant markets or stored for longer periods. Using the same kind of wax to coat mandarin oranges makes them shiny and decreases shriveling. Establishment of the best temperature for storage or shipping conditions for most crops resulted in keeping their quality for a much longer time. Modified atmosphere techniques keep the good quality of commodities for a much longer time. Controlled atmosphere storage system patented by PHTRC doubles the length of time that the good quality of mango can be kept during shipment to Europe and the Middle East. The use of ethylene adsorbents, patented also by PHTRC, slows down ripening of fruits, fading of flower color, and slowing down of yellowing of leafy vegetables. Using ethylene adsorbent and modified atmosphere packaging in 15 kg capacity crates or cartons of solo papaya resulted in 60 to 90% fruits, which are still green after 6 days. The technique has also delayed deterioration of Vanda orchids by two weeks. The design of a transport container van has been modified into a ventilated container van to decrease temperature inside sea ship vans of fruit. Vertical dividers used in non-ventilated vans can minimize losses of ship banana. Appropriate packing houses have been designed for mango, banana, durian, dragon fruit, cut orchids, and roses. Appropriate packages have been determined for specific commodities to reduce damage during transport and storage. The proper heights for piling boxes of mango have been determined to prevent damage during shipment and storage. Various manual and mechanized sizers and sorters have been fabricated for different fruits and vegetables. Optimized hot water treatment controls diseases that cause much losses of mango and papaya during shipment. This is used extensively by traders, exporters, and processors of mango and papaya. Modification of the vapor heat treatment for the control of fruit fly solved the problem of a quality defect development in mango that caused their rejection by Japanese importers. Extended hot water dip controls fruit flies that prevent mango export to mainland China. A hot water tank fueled by liquefied petroleum gas makes commercial hot water treatment in the field or collection center possible and easy. A larger prototype tank with a capacity of 440 kilograms of fruit was developed in collaboration with the Institute of Agricultural Engineering. Treatment of cabbage with alum controls soft rot and harvested cabbage by 70%. Alum is a cheap and locally available chemical. Keeping tomato in chlorinated coir dust is a cheap and effective way for farmers to keep tomato in bulk storage under ordinary conditions. Cooling pads and other cooling techniques offer a simple and inexpensive way to lengthen the useful life of commodities. Other types of evaporative coolers were also designed. Cheap and readily available sources of ethylene have been identified for ripening banana and tomato. These are squash peel, glericidia or kakawati leaves, and bilimbi or kamyas fruits. The proper system of preparing and washing cut up fresh fruits and vegetables ready to cook or to eat have been devised to maintain their quality and safety during storage and sale. Partially dehusked young coconut dipped in sodium metabisulfite can be shipped overseas without browning and growth of molds. The preservative FloraFresh maintains cut flower quality for a long time in flower shops. Dry pack storage of roses, chrysanthemums, and gladiolus maintains their quality during cold storage. Sugar pulsing technique improves the quality of cut flowers taken from cold storage. Other component programs include post-harvest systems improvement, quality assurance and food safety, packaging, and raw material handling.
Commodity-based post-harvest systems, where improvement and impact have been made, are developed post-harvest technologies as component of the handling system in the export of mango to Japan, Hong Kong, and China, and the export of organic bungulan banana to Japan. The PHTRC extension program and activities include action research projects and technical assistance to industry. PHTRC also offers summer short courses and regular courses for different industry stakeholders, holds conferences and study tours, participates in various agri-exhibits nationwide. The PHTRC has produced educational materials on post-harvest handling. It also continues to provide assistance to the horticulture industry, academic institutions, and research agencies. The PHTRC is the unit of UPLB that is pinpointed in the Agricultural Fisheries Modernization Act for post-harvest handling of perishables and is recognized as co-organizer and exhibitor of the biggest agricultural show in the country, the AgriLink. These achievements were facilitated by its linkages with Philippine and international institutions as well as industry. Due to its accomplishments, PHDRC has garnered 13 awards and accolades as an institution and more than 100 awards for its staff members. Through the years, PHDRC has supported instruction. It handles eight subjects leading to post-harvest field of specialization that is being offered by the Institute of Crop Science. It also supports instructional activities by initiating courses, publishing teaching materials, and providing its facilities for the courses. Today, the PHTRC continues its research and extension programs towards reducing losses, maintaining quality, and ensuring safety of perishable crops. UPLB provides its core funds, but most researches and training programs are funded by national and international agencies. Aside from providing funds, some international agencies also tap PHTRC for expert services and training. The PHTRC still faces the challenge of generating more basic information, especially on underutilized crops such as duhat, turmeric, arrowroot, and vegetable fern among others with industrial, nutraceutical, and medicinal potentials. It has to develop new and better post-harvest technologies and systems. It has to address training needs and strengthen the post-harvest extension delivery system. All these are being done towards a globally competitive horticulture industry. So uh, that 12-minute uh, video about uh, PHTRC represents the status of the uh, research, development, and extension uh, programs here in the Philippines because uh, PHTRC, boasting aside, is the only center in the Philippines that implements a comprehensive research, development, and uh, extension uh, program. So that, uh, that is why I am only five minutes is left for me for my presentation. So I'd like just to reiterate uh, the status of uh, post-harvest RDE here in the Philippines. Next, please. So I just want to uh, refresh on the importance of uh, post-harvest handling. Uh, for those who have not seen uh, this presentation, uh, food security, that is uh, really an, uh, a concern, not only here in the Philippines, but in several parts of the world, because of the problems of high post-harvest losses. And the uh, emphasis uh, for the past several years uh, has focused on increasing production. But increasing production is not the only solution to the problem of food uh, security. No? So, because we believe that uh, post-harvest loss reduction is a complementary method of solving food needs. No? And the other reasons, next please, uh, uh, th these are the reasons, no? so focus are on uh, increasing the yield, that's why you have new varieties, uh, package of technologies to increase productivity, 
Uh, the other is expanding the area of production, but uh, it's, not, it's now a, a growing problem because the agricultural lands have been converted into industrial parks, subdivisions, golf courses, etc. So it's becoming scarcer now, the uh, agricultural lands for uh, fresh produce. And the other, in the case of the Philippines, is to control the rate of population growth. No? We are very <laughs> productive when it comes to population. We are now almost 109 million, so you, we have more uh, mouth to feed. No? And uh, for us, decreasing losses no, is uh, one method or complementary method of uh, reducing uh, losses because of these advantages. No. So if you reduce the loss, you increase the amount of food available for uh, human consumption. It is cheaper. I always say that TLC, tender loving care, no, it's very simple. No. If all stakeholders will always put it in their mind, then uh, that's one uh, cheaper way of reducing loss. It is less risky, uh, a simple uh, technology. No? If it fails, then the loss is uh, very small compared with the losses during production. Depending on the crop, sometimes it takes four months for the crop to be harvested. And during that four-month period, losses can be high due to pests, insects, uh, abiotic factors, etc. Uh, energy is conserved. No? Uh, the inputs during production is conserved if you reduce the losses. And then uh, more rapid in producing results. No? Uh, for example, in the case of leafy vegetables, they uh, readily uh, deteriorate within five days. No? In the case of production, uh, it takes uh, four months before you see the result if you can harvest. But if you reduce the loss within five days, then you get a greater benefit. And then uh, this is what I'm telling about the areas now for agriculture. Uh, because of increasing urbanization and industrialization, uh, production areas are now uh, farther away from markets. We have produce coming from Mindanao, the farther, farthest points in Mindanao or in the uh, northern part of the Philippines. So how to deliver this produce uh, still of good quality and safe is a big challenge no, in post-harvest uh, work. No? And uh, now the uh, more, most of the production areas are in the mountains no? <laughs> because the people are occupying the lands in the lowlands. So we have difficulty in transport. You can produce good quality produce, but the logistics, uh, the market roads, the uh, transport conditions are very poor. So that contributes to uh, losses. Next, please. And then uh, there's a huge opportunity for the Philippines to export no, in different countries. But there are several concerns. No? If you want to uh, enter the different markets, they have different quality requirements, uh, safety requirements, and then we have to extend the storage life, especially if it will take about 28 days, 35 days for sea shipment to reach the markets in Middle East, in North America, and in Europe. And uh, that is a big challenge for us uh, researchers in post-harvest. And then, of course, the uh, requirements, the quarantine requirements of importing countries. No? So it's very easy to uh, recommend that you can do heat treatment, uh, you can do irradiation to control the pest not that the importing countries do not want, like the fruit flies. But we have to consider what are the effects of these treatments on the quality and the safety of the produce. No, it's not only that you kill the insects. No, you don't kill the consumers. No, so that is a big challenge also, and we consider that in our RDE programs. Uh, next, please. And of course. Uh, Global competition is very fierce. We are competing with other countries, uh, not only in the importing countries, but within the Philippines. No? We have a lot of imported fruits. No? We have citrus, we have the poncan, mandarin, apples, oranges. Uh, during these months up to December, they are cheaper compared with our mango. No? Because mango, 50 pesos almost per piece, compared with the 5 pesos for one can. So within the country, there is stiff competition, not only in the other countries. And of course, this growing attention or concern on quality and the safety. 
uh, consumers now are con uh, increasingly patronizing the uh, supermarkets. That's why maybe in the near future, every corner we have the SM, we have the, the uh, other uh, supermarkets because consumers think that if they buy in supermarkets, the quality is good and also they're assured of the safety of the produce that they buy. No? So uh, that's my favorite picture at the middle. Consumers buy with their eyes, no? the quality. No? The, also Dr. Roll's uh, favorite also now. No? And then, uh, next please. So um, those are the, some of the uh, concerns. And there, there are emerging concerns. Uh, Senator Villar mentioned about the halal. No? There's a big budget for halal no? because of the uh, uh, big population of Muslims compared with the uh, Catholics. No? So we, we put them in our mind, uh, Senator. No? So these are just the history no? of the efforts towards uh, loss reduction. So that started in 1974 when there was a World Food uh, Congress. So um, food loss prevention was... Uh, uh, considered as a program no, to meet uh, the uh, mankind's food requirement and then that, that was followed in 1975 by the UN uh, United Nations General Assembly uh, recommendation that uh, there should be a reduction of post-service losses especially in developing countries as a matter of priority and uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization initiated the uh, programs on food loss prevention. Uh, that is why, because of that recognition of the uh, need to reduce post-service losses, in 1977, through the uh, funds from the, uh, from the Australian government, through the Australian ASEAN Economic Cooperation Program, uh, PHTRC was established. Uh, the building, the facilities, the laboratories, even the personnel, the researchers, scientists from Australia and also from other countries uh, came over to the Philippines to uh, train the uh, manpower of UPLB. UPLB was chosen as the site because during that time, uh, in 1975, even early uh, 70s, uh, there was already a pool of multidisciplinary experts here at UPLB. That's why they chose UPLB as the site of the ASEAN Center. No? And then, uh, next please. Uh, in 1982, no, uh, because we, uh, they thought, not we, I'm still not there. <laughs> I am there, but I'm still young <laughs> during that time. It was considered, uh, there was this uh, recommendation uh, of the Association of Colleges of Agriculture uh, in the Philippines or the ACAP to infuse post-harvest technology in their existing agricultural courses. No? And then 1990, uh, before it was NAFAR, and then it became BPRE, Bureau of Post-Harvest Research and Extension. Now it is FILMEC under the Department of Agriculture, Philippine mechanization, <laughs> Miss, Miss Miriam will tell that later. So it became FILMEC under the Department of Agriculture. They were mandated in the 1990s to cover also perishables. Because before BIPRE or FILMEC, uh, they focused more on grains and other durable crops, no? and uh, the focus is more on mechanization. And then in 1997, the uh, Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act, or AFMA, identified the PHTRC, uh, or they recognized the uh, significance of PHTRC in post-service handling of both durables and perishables. So this is together with FILMEC. So from 1997 up to now, up to the present, uh, because of that growing uh, uh, recognition of the importance of post-harvest, we were able to uh, solicit funds, etc., and uh, funding from uh, both uh, national and international uh, funding agencies to continue our efforts in uh, uh, attaining at the goal of reducing post-harvest losses, maintaining quality, and assuring quality. No? So, uh, what is the status now of all those efforts? No? Still, there is a lack of awareness among the different industry stakeholders on the, uh, post, uh, on the notion that post-harvest losses can be prevented or minimized. 
there are two uh, attitudes no, that still pervade the uh, post-harvest system. No? Uh, that is fatalism and tolerance. When you ask the traders, when you ask the farmers, when you tell them that you can reduce losses, they said, no, it is part of the system. Losses are part of the system. No? Because they say that nothing can be done to reduce losses. So we have to demonstrate no, that losses can be reduced. That is why we do more of the action research uh, projects wherein the uh, end users or the target users of the technology are already included in the development of the technology and that was uh, uh, that started with Dr. Lisada during the uh, projects on uh, was that APSIP ma'am or yeah, uh, HR? <laughs> Yeah, the, the APSIP, no, the ASEAN Australian uh, project. That's why when you saw, you saw the picture of the bananas in bulk in container vans, so the traders were together in how to reduce the losses in this bulk handled bananas so that, such that when the bananas reach uh, Metro Manila from Mindanao, no, many or a big uh, percentage of the bananas are overripe. Uh, with mechanical damage or unmarketable. No? So uh, we uh, still, uh, are still continuing our efforts on changing the mindset of the uh, stakeholders that we can reduce losses and we can, they can compete. No? And then uh, there are very few researchers on post-harvest handling of tropical uh, perishable crops. No? So PHTRC is the number one, <laughs> of course. And then uh, we have partners, the uh, Filmec. But the focus of Filmec is more on mechanization and durables, although uh, we have uh, joint projects on uh, perishable crops. And then, of course, our graduates who are now uh, faculty members and researchers and also extension workers of the universities where they came from. Uh, from the uh, Visayas State uh, University, uh, June Acedo, our former, uh, Dr. June Acedo, our former trainee here during the ASEAN long course. So he initiated programs on post-harvest at the Visayas State University. Uh, CMU is Central Mindanao University. I hope Dr. Luela Cabahog is here. Ah, Dr. Luela, she is a graduate of... Uh, PHTRC, although PHTRC is a non-degree granting unit, so she spearheaded the post-harvest activities there. Uh, Benguet State University, uh, Dr. Emma Ruth Bayogan, uh, a PhD graduate here, and so she initiated programs in there, and then she transferred to UP Mindanao. So at least we have now partner uh, in Mindanao because before they're still tapping people from Mindanao, people from the Visayas, from the uh, northern part of the Philippines always stop the uh, the PhDRC, okay. and then uh, there are very few agricultural schools uh, teaching post harvest, and that is the reason why uh, post harvest uh, as a course is not included in the agriculture board exam because uh, SAUs requested uh, that uh, it the inclusion of post-harvest be deferred because they have not fully uh, developed the post-harvest science in their curriculum. Next, please. And then uh, extension workers, these are our partners, no? but only about 2% uh, no? out of the 10,000 extension workers uh, have been trained on post-harvest. Unfortunately, many of them have retired or are already aging. So we have to prepare to increase the pool of the uh, manpower of the extension or the extension agents. And then there are very few information materials on post-harvest handling of tropical uh, horticultural crops. No? So we have developed, but we still need to continue developing more of this information materials. Okay. So these are the future needs. Capability building, manpower development of all industry stakeholders, the researchers, extension workers, and teachers, physical resources like laboratories. We have to equip them with this basic uh, equipment needed for post-harvest research. Uh, not only them, but also us, PhDRC, because our vice chancellor is here. And then uh, complementation and linkages. Uh, we still uh, 
we will still continue this uh, complementation because research is very expensive. So we have to complement the activities of the different agencies involved in post-harvest research and then establishment of regional centers. No? Uh, we are really envisioning for PHDRC to be the national center for post-harvest of tropical uh, horticultural perishables. And then we will have regional or virtual centers because it's very expensive to have regional centers. So in the Visayas, uh, in Mindanao, and also some sonal centers, because in the case of training, the DAATI is the uh, service provider, so we uh, hope to link with them. And then uh, we uh, envision to strengthen the knowledge bank on uh, post-harvest horticulture. This is in the case of uh, information and extension materials. Okay? So that's all, and uh, thank you, and have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Esguera, for giving us an overview of the status of post-harvest research and extension in the country. Well, it is indeed a very proud and uh, honorable moment presenting to you the PHDRC's achievement for the last 40 years. Just like we are proud and honored to be celebrating today with another achiever. To introduce our keynote speaker, may we call on the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, Dr. Enrico P. Sopanco. Thank you, Arlan. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, this is one of my uh, most difficult tasks, uh, you know, introducing someone that uh, you personally, I really admire. Because you know? every time I see her on TV, especially on issues on agriculture, parang palaban eh. You know? Yung palaging, lalo na pag yung mga issues ay medyo nakaka-apekto sa sa mga small farmers, she's always there, uh, you know, uh, taking the cages to protect them. So, going straight, I uh, guess, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our keynote speaker today is none other than Senator Cynthia Aguilar Villar. She earned her degree in Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of the Philippines College of Business Administration which uh, recognized her as one of its distinguished alumni in 2004. Recently, in August 2017, she was awarded as the most distinguished alumna by the UP Alumni Association. She completed her master's degree in business administration at the New York University. She practiced as a financial analyst and college professor until she married former House Speaker and Senate President Manny Villar in 1975. She then helped her husband in various entrepreneurial ventures, eventually making Vistaland the biggest home builders in the Philippines. She managed a private development bank from 1989 to 1998. In 2001, Senator Villar won in a landslide victory victory as representatives of Las Piñas to the Philippines House of Representatives, where she completed three terms or nine years of service until 2010. Currently, she is the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food. As chair, she tackled every issues affecting the agriculture sector as on top of providing legislative support by filing sponsoring and pursuing agriculture-related bills. During the 16th Congress, she was able to steer the passage into law of 16 significant bills on agriculture. Among them are Republic Act uh, 10,845, or the Act declaring large-scale agricultural smuggling as economic sabotage, and RA 10.817 of the Philippine Halal Export Development and Promotion Act, and also RA 10.848, or the extension of the utilization of the Agriculture Competitive Enhancement Fund, or ASEF, until 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker today, Senator Cynthia Villar.
a very pleasant good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to be here on your post-harvest horticulture training and research center 40th anniversary here in the UPLB, College of Agriculture and Food Science. And it's a kind of uh, uh, memorable for me because our housing company, Vistaland, started in 1975. We're just two years older than you, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and uh, I, I all, when I see that, I said that um, maybe we can ask the question, who has helped more Filipinos, Vistaland or <laughs> PHRC? <laughs> anyway, I want to greet uh, our host for this morning. We have here Dr. Elda Esquera, director of PHTRC. Uh, and of course, uh, <clears throat> In uh, talking to her, I want to remind her that maybe we should include in your name post-harvest horticultural training and research center and extension, okay? Because I don't believe that uh, research will just be research. We should be able to teach it to our people. Because what good is research if we cannot share it with our people? especially our uh, micro and small enterprises. In the Philippines, 99% of all the businesses are medium, micro, and small. And 4% lang yung medium. 95% are micro and small. It is not true that we have large companies in the Philippines. We are supported by micro, small, and enterprises which provide 65% of the job and all the micro and small enterprises, 50% them are in food. Kaya if you do extension services to this micro and small, then <laughs> it will really help the Philippines go forward. And of course, uh, uh, you don't, uh, I've tried asking the state universities and colleges to do extension for, I waited for two years uh, because uh, I, I thought that they should be the one to teach, not in higher learning but in extension, to reach this micro and small, but I failed. So I decided to look for the private sector and so far, I have uh, recruited 920 farm schools in the Philippines, and I hope we could reach that 920 farm schools in the Philippines. We have a farm school in every provinces, and uh, uh, there are only 1,600 towns and cities in the Philippines. And my dream is that we will have a farm school in all of them. But so far, we have 920. That is about more than one school for every two towns in the Philippines. So if you want to teach extension, this is the outlet where you will go to. And it will be supported by TESDA. TESDA has given 30% of their training budget to agriculture because agricultural workers are 30% of all our workers in the Philippines. So I told TESDA, that you have to give us 30% before they give only uh, 3% <laughs> because they said that nobody is, wants to study agriculture. But I don't think so. I, I think they want to study agriculture, but there's no place to study agriculture that is accessible to them because they are the poorest in this country. They have no money to pay for transportation, they have no money to pay for board, and they have no money, money to pay for tuition. On the average, a farmer and a fisherman in the Philippines earns only uh, 4,500 a month, or 150 pesos a day, which is $3 a day. So they have no resources. So we hope that by building these farm schools, uh, TESTA will pay for the tuition. So uh, those who will be teaching, will be, this will be their source of income also for the farms. And at the same time, 
uh, a way of teaching other farmers and uh, uh, learning, especially when you say that one of our, of course, one of our problem is how to produce more and at the same time not to waste what we have produce. In fact, I've uh, lectured on this to Filmec who are here and Phil Rice because they uh, contend that it's not, their work is research, not extension. When I went through their, the laws which established them, it's very clear that they have to do extension as well. Because what will, what will research do if we cannot share it? with our people. So, yun lang ang uh, gusto kong sabihin kay uh, Dr. Esquera that we have to do more extension. And of course, I wish to acknowledge our guest, uh, Ms. Narja Simpson of the Economic Counselor of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia. I have been to many places in the country. I would like to say that us, uh, us age is more active than USAID. <laughs> maybe in agriculture because I tour agricultural places and maybe we share the same passion for agriculture because both our countries are agricultural countries. And of course, Dr. Chris Dorado, Vice Chancellor for Administration of UP Los Baños. In fact, I've told your Chancellor that you have to change your uh, your way of teaching agriculture. Because they always train uh, professors and researchers, they don't train farm managers. So when we look for farm managers, uh, your graduates are not trained to become farm managers. How can we make our farm more uh, uh, productive when we don't have good farm managers? So I think they're changing. I've spoke to Ched. They're changing their curriculum for agriculture to produce more farm managers than uh, kasi yung mga in-employ kong uh, farm managers umalis eh, because they want to teach daw and they don't they want to do research so <laughs> medyo hindi yata maganda yun kasi kung lahat tayo researchers and teachers who will manage the farms and Dr. Enrico Supanco, Dean of College of Agriculture and Food Science. And of course, our guest from uh, Republic of Korea, Dr. Ji Gan Kim. Thank you for whatever the help you're uh, giving our country. Thank you very much. And Dr. Rosa S. Role uh, from the UNFAO. Uh, I always go there, but more on the big sessions twice a year. And I find it uh, very interesting, okay. And Dr. Maria Concepcion Lizada, former director and retired professor. Palakpakan po natin silang lahat. Uh, Ms. Cynthia De Guia, Assistant Head Program Development Division of DA Bar, okay. And Dr. Corazon Asusena, former UPLB and PHTRC Extension Coordinator and Retired Professor. Palakpakan po natin siya. And uh, Dr. Reynaldo Ebora, Acting Executive Director of DOST, uh, Bicard. Okay. And all the researchers, the educators, the students who are here, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <coughs> to the post-harvest PHTRC for inviting me to be part of your 40th anniversary. I'm happy and honored to be here with all of you. This is my first time here. I didn't know that there is a post-harvest training and research center. <laughs> so I've been a, a, a chairman of the Senate Committee on Agriculture since 2013. Uh, and. Uh, I, I, they asked me, why did you go to agriculture? Are you good in agriculture? My training is finance. If I will look at my training, I'll go to the Committee on Finance. But you know, uh, we have a foundation, the Villar C Social Institute for Poverty Reduction and Governance. And our, uh, our uh, advocacy is 
livelihood, establishing livelihood for the poor people and uh, environmental protection and uh, helping OFWs. So when I saw that the poorest people are in agriculture, then I have to be in agriculture to uh, uh, help with my ad advocacy. So I really chose agriculture. And, uh, and when there's opportunity, I also chose. Uh, so I'm now the chairman of the Environment and Natural Resources also. And uh, I got the chairmanship of the agrarian reform because our <coughs> chairman left for uh, uh, being a senator to become a secretary of uh, foreign affairs. And he left me the chairmanship of uh, agrarian reform. So I'm stuck with all the issues about agriculture because I, would st I believe that uh, sustainable environment is sustainable agriculture. So they go together. Congratulations to PHTRC on their anniversary. There is no question that in 40 years, I read your, your history, you have truly served the fresh produce industry through science and technology. The many awards and distinctions received by PHTRC and its staff members during the last four decades speak for themselves. And uh, PHTRC has successfully lived up to the objectives for which it was established in 1977 to reduce post-harvest food losses back then during the late 1970s and early 1980s. And the choice of U, uh, UPLB as the site of the building and the training project is, of course, needless to say, an excellent one. I could not imagine it anywhere else. Uh, maganda din yung Central Luzon University, but it's farther. You're nearer to Metro Manila. I hope you will uh, uh, continue your work with more extension. In fact, I'm inviting you to teach in my two farm schools that I have established, one in uh, Las Piñas to serve Southern Luzon and NCR, the Metro Manila, and another one in Bulacan to serve Central, Northern, and the Cordilleras. And uh, uh, I hope you can teach there so that we can reach the co-ops, the farm schools, and the interested LGUs. Alam nyo, misan, Ayoko sa LGUs kasi tingin ko uh, namamasyal lang sila and they have no interest in teaching afterwards. Personally and as a legislator, I have always been a firm believer in the importance of research and development as well as technology in key industries and endeavors in both the private and the public sector that ultimately lead to sustainable growth and development of our country. That is why I'm glad that I got the vice chairmanship also of the Senate Committee on Science and Technology. As a social entrepreneur, I know firsthand how technological innovation can improve people's lives. For instance, it played an important role in one in my livelihood programs that I set up for Villar Social Institute for Poverty Alleviation and Governance. We call it Villar CPAG because CPAG means hard work. And I think our people need hard work to get out of our poverty. But it's not about uh, lessening post-harvest losses. Uh, I use waste as a raw material. So I uh, both serve the environmental problem as well as the uh, poverty problem. Yeah. And uh, I established a coconut weaving enterprise. It was the decorticating machine invented by Dr. Arboleda, former dean of the Bicol University's College of Agriculture that paved the way for the production of coconuts from waste coconut husks. And these coconuts are being used for slow protection. And it's very cheap. It's 80% cheaper than cement. His invention was named as the best innovative project for the grassroots levels in the 2005 BBC World Challenge, wherein he bested 456 entries from 90 countries. 
It is a good example of how a simple invention is now the source of livelihood of many families and has helped a city get rid of waste that clog rivers and waterways, causing flood. Another technology which I, uh, I uh, learned from a young boy from Mindanao is to convert plastic waste into school chairs. Of course, afterwards, uh, the invention is not perfect, so the OST helped me improve the quality of the chairs, and at the same time, I, I did some solar projects so that the cost of producing the chair in terms of electricity will be lower. And another one which I'm doing also is the composting of kitchen and garden waste. Doon natulungan ako ng UP Los Baños. So, so really, you have to collaborate with uh, people to improve your products and to reduce cost. Okay. As the current chairperson of the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food, I am a staunch supporter of incorporating R&D in the agriculture sector, which also helps improve agricultural mechanization efforts. Even the National Economic Development Authority has acknowledged that we need to invest in R&D to fast track the growth and development of the agriculture sector, which is crucial for an agricultural country like the Philippines, where the majority or two-thirds of the population are directly and indirectly involved in agriculture. Now, with regional economic integration under the ASEAN economic community upon us, and we should brace for tougher competition, RSD is, of course, a key component in science and technology, an area of cooperation in AEC. I know that the Philippines' R&D is making good progress vis-a-vis -vis our Asian neighbors, but admittedly, it is still not as fast as we would have wanted it to be. But based on what I have read, it is estimated that the country's R&D output has increased by 300%. Considered then as one of the stumbling blocks in the, is the un inadequate budget of the Department of Science and Technology, particularly R&D, since almost all government departments have R&D components in their operation. But that has been addressed. The DOST budget has increased considerably considerably in the last few years. In fact, since last year, the OST is among the 10 top departments under the executive branch with biggest budget, as it should. But it was also pointed out to me by the National Research Council of the Philippines that while the budget allocation has continually increased, the percentage share in the country's domestic product has not even reached 1%. It stands at around 0.09% of our GDP, okay, which is very low compared to our neighboring countries. Malaysia spends 0.63% of the GDP, Thailand 0.25, and Taiwan 2.3%. So we're far off. So it is good that there are other organizations and institutions such as the UPLB and PHTRC, which provide the much needed training and extension support, especially to the agriculture sector. And we encourage more private sector participation in the areas of R&D as well as science and technology. I'm also a staunch supporter of agricultural mechanization because there is a study that uh, for our farmers to be profitable and to bring them out of poverty, we have four problems. Uh, technology, mechanization, the lack of financial literacy, and the inability to uh, access cheap loans. They want to borrow from 5-6. Uh, we call that the usurers, 5-6. And why do we call it 5-6 for every 5 pesos you borrow today, you pay 6 pesos tomorrow. So that's 20% a day, 7,200% a year. 
who will make money that will amount to 7,200% a year. Our company will be happy if we earn 20% a year. So I was telling the farmers, if you borrow from 5-6, the only way you can survive is not to pay your loans. <laughs> because if you pay your loans, then uh, we're all dead. <laughs> so it is good that uh, I'm also, I have time and again cited that based on studies, of course, these are the barriers. We have reviewed the implementation of the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act, or AFMA, under Republic Act Number 8435, and of RA 10601, or the AFMEC law, to ensure that it is maximized and reaches the intended beneficiaries. AFMA calls for the allocation of at least uh, 20 billion a year for agriculture mo mo modernization related projects and programs. And of course, uh, we have done that. Our agricultural budget has increased. The AFMEC law will help promote the development and adoption of modern, appropriate, cost effective, and environmentally safe agriculture and fisheries machineries and equipment to enhance farm productivity and efficiency, to achieve food securities, and increase farmers' income. But the problem with our ACMET, they are not doing extension work. When I interviewed them, they said that their work is research. But when I look at the mandate which created them, eh, it involves extension. So we're trying to force them to do extension, as well as fill rice. Yung, uh, uh, one of the most, the barriers in uh, making us self-sufficient in rice is the right seedlings. And that is being done by fill rice. Uh, they are doing research on uh, rice seedlings, but they are not teaching the farmers how to do it. Okay. Because after uh, conducting research on something, we have to teach the farmers to be able to do it. Because if we do not, then there is no benefit from the research. Agricultural and fisheries mechanization, of course, uh, that is their work. Actually, we started late in our mechanization efforts only about five years ago while our Asian neighbors started mechanizing their farms over three decades in the 1970s. So we have a lot of catching up to do. Data shown to me cite that the Philippines lag behind its regional neighbors in farm mechanization. According to the Philippine Center for Post-Harvest Development and Mechanization, the country's level of mechanization is at two horsepower per hectare. Behind our Asian neighbors, Japan has 18.87 horsepower per hectare, Korea at 9.38, and Thailand has 4.2 horsepower per hectare. That is all for crops. For rice and corn crops, the recent level of mechanization is 2.31 horsepower per hectare, based from Filmec data. The DA and Filmec earlier reported that they hope to bring the country's mechanization level to 3.5 or 4 hectares, 4 horsepower per hectare by 2016. I would have to check if they have accomplished that. So. <laughs> While post-harvest losses are generally a main concern of the agriculture sector, post-harvest problems in horticultural crops are more specific and thankfully, PHTRC is there to provide relevant assistance and support services, both to the academe and industry. Remember, academe and industry. Wala yung ating micro and small. <laughs> Kaya siguro yun ang dapat nating include for after all. They are the biggest in this country. And I do hope that it will strengthen its links with other industries such as fruit, vegetable, ornamental, and other perishable crop industry. They will really benefit from the extensive research and extension work at PHTRC, provide input 
post-harvest handling of fresh produce. You know, I'm an honorary member of the Philippine Horticultural Society. So when you invited me, I thought it will be limited to flowers. <laughs> Kasi yun ang trabaho namin do sa Philippine Horticultural Society. I'm so surprised that yung horticulture pala kasama ang fruits and vegetables. <laughs> so marami pa akong dapat matutunan sa inyo. And I'm sure... But I'm sure the Philippine Horticultural Society will benefit also from you, okay? And I just want to remind before I end my talk that uh, micro and small comprise 95% of our, uh, all the businesses in the Philippines and 50% uh, of them are in food. So maybe it's time to look at them as an outlet for our research and development. Having said all that, I would like to congratulate PHTRC on their 40th anniversary and wish all the individuals and organizations behind it more power and all the best in their undertaking. Let us continue to dialogue, discuss, and discover ways and means to support the Philippine agriculture sector and our country. At siyempre, pag napa-improve natin ang agriculture, then we bring out this country out of poverty. That is very important. So with that, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat and God bless us all. Thank you very much, Senator Cynthia Villar, for sharing your wisdom and gracing our 40, uh, P the PHTRC 40th Anniversary Symposium. And now, we are now starting the first open forum of the symposium with Dr. Maria Concepcion C. Lizara, Professor Emeritus and former PHCRC Director as moderator. Maganda umaga po, ma'am. Good morning to everybody. Uh, just to put uh, what, maybe just to emphasize what uh, Senator Villar mentioned, there are just two points. For me, the holistic view of agriculture, the holistic view of agriculture. Oh. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, uh, I wish to just uh, emphasize two things. Uh, it's really heartwarming. It's very insightful in her part to uh, tell us about a holistic view of agriculture, putting together the farm, or the farming activities, the environment, and the human wear. And, uh, you know, this emphasizing the uh, farming schools leading to the production, to the generation of good farm managers. So when one looks at it, uh, Senator Villar is the most appropriate person for agriculture, giving it an entrepreneurial perspective, which means then that it, this is a way to uh, ensure the mainstreaming of our small holders. We really need to mainstream those smallholders, which then leads us to the market and the fact that she mentioned PHDRC is near Metro Manila and therefore nearest the biggest market in the Philippines. So uh, with that, I'd like to open this uh, open forum, uh, but I'd like to give a privilege to a very important person. Uh, fortunately, he, he can come. This is Dr. Edgardo Kisumbing who used to have the externally funded projects, programs of the department, the whole department of agriculture, and who for a time was our own director. Uh, so if, if nobody minds, I would like to give the first uh, opportunity for raising a question to Dr. Kisumbing.
Thank you, Connie. Uh, Honorable Villar, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I, I am really happy to be here. I jump at this opportunity to see my children grew up to be mature researchers. When we started, they hardly even have a postgraduate degree. Now, most of them have PhDs and master's degrees, and they have accomplished a lot. There's only one message that I would like to convey, though, so that you will all know the problem. You saw the fantastic achievements of the center over the years, and you have seen their views of what they want to do. But the problem really is sustainable funding to accomplish those things that they have been doing. And we have the opportunity to get that from the research that they have done. For example, I was surprised to know that the hot water treatment that is used all over the world now for controlling fruit flies for mangoes have not benefited the university at all directly. The researchers have not benefited. There's a tremendous amount of money that should have been gotten if we had a system of uh, collecting royalties for the use of the technology. Can you imagine how much uh, that particular technology alone uh, could support in terms of uh, additional research, graduate studies, extension, and future plans? So I, I know that the university has been working on this. Some departments get royalties like food science, microbiological agents that are developed, by the scientists, uh, the scientists get royalty from that for making toyo and you know, those sort of things. So if it's being done in food science, why not do it uh, university-wide, particularly for post-service uh, horticulture? Uh, that is my message, but I, I would like to add one more because Senator Villar mentioned about fruits and vegetables. Uh, you all know Dr. Roberto Coronel. He has a four hectare farm uh, just in Kalawang where he has collected a vast collection of exotic and native fruits, many, many varieties. That land is being sold to be made into a subdivision. What will happen to all that collection that Dr. Coronel devoted his life? Uh, Dr. Coronel at one point was a member of, was a staff of the Post Harvest Horticulture Center. I think we should put our heads together and see if we can have a foundation, uh, buy that land and maintain it as a, a collection of uh, fruit varieties. Can uh, I make a comment on that with regards to conversion? Yes. Because this is something that we should uh, know. I've gone all around the Philippines. It's in only in Central Luzon that uh, the place is fully developed for agriculture. All the others, there are plenty of uh, uh, land not not planted to anything, okay? I would just like to say uh, that usually those ask uh, con conversion are being done in the cities. Uh, I'm surprised that they're doing a subdivision in Kalawan. Kalawan is not is not a good market for houses. Usually the houses, the industries, and the commercial centers they are built in the cities. And if they buy you, you're lucky if you are a farmer because you will get a lot of money from the sale, uh, which will be more than what you will earn in your whole lifetime. And if you want to start another farm, uh, if you sell your, your land in the cities, you can go outside and with the money you have, you can buy large portion of land outside the cities because they are cheap. If you are being bought by a developer or a commercial developer or a, a, a what do you call this, uh, industries, you're lucky because you will be paid a lot and you can build a business, you can build a home, you can start another farm outside the city. So that is a misconception. Uh, we should not uh, be always saying that we are not producing because uh, the developers are getting our land. It's not true. There are plenty of land in the provinces 
uh, either they get leased or they are sold or they, they remain unused. Oh. So our problem in agricultural productivity is that we don't teach them the technology, we, teach, we don't teach them the mechanization, we don't teach them the financial literacy to make their land more productive and profitable for them. That's our problem. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, let's say uh, we have done land reform for 50 years. It did not amount to anything because we just gave the land. We did not empower the farmer to develop their land. That is more important. We could have done it that we uh, slowly given the land and at the same time slowly empowered them. So what did the farmers do with their land? Either they sell it or they lease it back and become farmers again with the lesser or they just left it there without any development. So this is a misconception really. Why? In fact, I went to Israel. They're not interested in the soil. They can do farming uh, upward with water only. And the water they use is patak-patak, or not the irrigation, because they have no soil, and the water is from the, the ocean, and it's all, they have to desalinate. And desalination is very expensive, so they control the water by, uh, what do you call this, computer. So it's just dripping, but they export vegetables. They're very good at that. So I think it's, it's not the soil, it's not the water, it's the technology and the mechanization that is important. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Senator. But the reality is that the family is not interested in the land anymore. They are all in the US. And uh, they just said, uh, you know, sell it. And so they're looking for a buyer. You know, I went, and, to, uh, I went to France. I visited the family farm school in France. And they have thousands of family farm, farm school. Uh, considering France is a very developed country. And I met, uh, I, they sent me to one student of their farm school. And I talked to him and I said, uh, uh, how big is your land? 100 hectares. And what do you plant? Wheat. And I said, who gave you the land? My parents. Because I'm the only one who would like to stay here. All my siblings went to Paris to become lawyers and accountants. That's what I'm saying to the people. If your children do not want to stay in the land, give the land to your children who will stay there so that you motivate, motivate him to stay and become farmers. Because if you will tell your children that those who will stay in the land will get the land, I think one will stay and get the land, okay? And then I asked him, uh, how many employees do you have? And he said, none, I'm the only one. I'm fully, com I'm, I'm fully mechanized. My, my tractor has GPS. And my harvester has a drying component to it, yeah. And, uh, and he's supporting his parents. I saw the parents, they're living there with him, okay. And I said, who are maintaining your machine? Sabi niya, I do, my maintenance also. I studied in the farm school to do maintenance. So uh, uh, these are misconceptions. I mean, uh, uh, kaya naman umaalis yung mga anak, walang gusto mag stay sa land kasi hinahati niyo yung land among all of them even if you stay there but if you give it to one i'm sure he's going to stay in the land i, ho oh. I hope that will happen pero kung walang mag uh, walang magagawa tayo diyan uh, we wake up one morning that land has been sold and the collection valuable collection of fruit trees will be gone thank you Oh, just a uh, note, please keep your question short and sweet because uh, the precious time of uh, Senator Villar is uh, need, may be needed for uh, other appointments. Um, uh, Prof. Rimando. I have a question to ask. I, do, I don't know who can answer it, no. When I was a member of this uh, center, there used to be 
more people sa extension, and in fact, we have a very strong extension for people uh, are working under Dr. Asasena, but now well, how not like, disappear. It's profitable now to do extension because TESDA will pay for the tuition of students. A teacher can teach 25 students, and for three months, they will pay you 300,000 for teaching 25 students. That's 100,000 a month. So uh, if you want to make money, you teach, uh, you establish a small farm school, one hectare lang, and teach extension, and you will have 100,000 a month. Uh, I think 100,000 is much more than what you get from UP. Uh, well, how much do you get? Ana, 800,000 per year. Uh, no, for your salary. What is your salary? Huh? No, what is your salary per month? Per month, my salary is close. Oh, <laughs> ikaw ang head. How about the, the, research, the extension worker? Oh, you will get 100,000 a month. In fact, yung mga nandun nga sa... ATI gusto na mag-retire at magturo na lang sa farm school. Eh. Baka daw mas malaki pa kitain nila. 25 students. You can teach more, 20, more than 25 students. If you are a good teacher, you can teach uh, every day. <laughs> you can teach more and you will earn more. So this, that's why I asked TESDA to give this budget to, to motivate the extension workers to do extension that's the the reason behind it yes so. but i think it's a matter of money you see when we are still in yung post harvest center in monos has a national budget and yet doon sa post harvest namin is a part of the up budget so ano um, alam mo i've looked at the budget of the philippine government they're all overhead if you ask them, uh, ano ba ginawa nyo para sa mga tao, you will find out na maswerte tayo na makaneto ang tao ng 25% of the budget. 50% is overhead, tapos yung natitirang 50% for the people, binabawasan pa nila, overhead pa uli. <laughs> oh. So, walang natitira para sa mga tao. Kasi, so, I don't believe anymore about uh, government budget. I've seen all their budgets. And I think we should motivate each person to do extension based on what he, he or will accomplish. Kaya maganda tong TESDA kasi mags maturo ka marami, malaki pera mo. Pag hindi ka nagturo, wala kang pera. That, that should be the ano, motivation, di ba? Oo. Huwag natin intayin yung budget ng government kasi pag budget ng government, puro overhead din lang babagsak. Kaya wala rin namang ma add sa ating industries. I've seen their budget, terrible budget. <laughs> Dr. Andales, who used to be the director of Bipre, now Filmec, uh, has a question. Uh, yes, I like I like the uh, reminder of Senator Villar to PHTRC that uh, they should uh, also consider uh, seriously the extension uh, aspect. Uh, I asked the fourth uh, director of uh, PELMIC, uh, it used to be the name is NAFIRE, National Post Harvest Institute for Research and Extension. So if uh, Raul is here, he, he can, uh, Raul is our uh, deputy director now of PILMIC. Uh, he can uh, uh, also uh, provide you with the history of uh, uh, PILMIC, which was NAFIRE. Okay, thank you for information. I think Filmec will be establishing uh, 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 
branches, at least in one in Visayas, one in Mindanao, and two in Luzon, to show the machines that they have uh, 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 built for the mechanization of our farms. And uh, hopefully, they will build also a training center beside their uh, uh, branches and will encourage people to ask questions about the machines that they have built and maybe if they want to get training, how do they get training in using the machine. So we have a budget for shared facilities program, both in the Department of Agriculture, Department of Trade and Industry, and the Department of Science and Technology. So we can give machines for free, provided you are a co-op, you are an organization of farmers, you are a black farm in the land reform areas, or you are an LGU. So we can, with this, we can do mechanization because we will be giving the machineries for free and then Filmec, hopefully, and the supplier of the machineries will teach the people how to use the machineries. Okay. Uh, we have time for just one more question. And if it would be nice if one of the clients of PHTRC raises a question. Any farmer, uh, trader? Uh, if there are no questions, I'm sure you can get in touch with Senator Villar. Uh, there's an email system for, for the Senate, and you can just get in touch with her. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Villar, and thank you for those who participated. Thank you, Dr. Connie Lezada, for uh, serving as the moderator for this open forum. And now to present the plaque of appreciation to Senator Villar, may we call on Dr. Chris Dorado, Dean Enrico Sopanco, and Director Elda Esguera. So let me read the plaque. So Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, PHTRC, presents this plaque of appreciation to Senator Cynthia A. Villar for sharing invaluable wisdom and expertise as keynote speaker on its 40th anniversary. Given on the 27th day of October 2017 at the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Laguna, Philippines, signed by Dr. L. W. S. Guerra, Director of PHTRC.
ng budget. I can make money for, I can give you a budget for that. I didn't know about it. Okay, ma'am, kasi the researchers are also doing extension. And that's good because you know what it is. But you need more. But we need more. Okay, sige. So we have a proposal. Yeah. Papalitan na lang. Nasaan na yung kapalitan? Nasaan yung mga kapalitan? Papalitan na po. Wala na po. Si Dr. Kino, papapalitan na po. Mar, yun, nakuha mo yung presentation ni Dr. Dr. Rowe, do you have your presentation? So we can appear. Is it? What's the final? I'll give you. I'll give you to find it. I know this is full. Okay. Marion. Marion, do we have a pointer? So we are on to the second part of our symposium. So the first panel discussion. So may we invite our speakers, Dr. Ji Gang Kim, Dr. Rosa S. Rowe, uh, Dr. Reynaldo Villebora, and Ms. Uh, Cynthia Remedios de Guia to come in front. So while we are enjoying our refreshment, we will continue with the panel discussion on capacity building in advancing the horticulture industry. Our first speaker for this panel discussion is Dr. Ji Gang Kim, the director of the Asia Post Harvest Research Center, APRC, which has a 25 years of research experience in post-harvest technology of horticultural crops and fresh cut produce processing. Kim has a bachelor's degree in horticultural science and a master's degree in food science. He received his doctorate degree in food science from Hiroshima University. He has served as vice president of the Korean Society for Horticultural Science, or KSHS, the Korean Society of International Agriculture, KSIA, and the Korean Post-Harvest Technology Association. He has a certification as a professional food engineer. He has conducted research on quality maintenance and food safety of horticultural crops and fresh cut products since 1992 at the NIHHS RDA. He has a certification as a professional food, uh, he has conducted research on quality maintenance and uh, of horticultural crops and fresh cut since 1992. He has been developing practical post-harvest handling manuals of fresh fruits and vegetables for post-harvest industry. These days, he is conducting international cooperative projects with 13 ASEAN, Asian countries and 15 African countries to improve post-harvest management of horticultural crops. 
He is trying to reduce post-harvest losses of fruits and vegetables in developing countries through international cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Ji Gang Kim. Uh, thank you, Alan. Can you show my slides? Maganda <laughs> umaga. It's my big pleasure to be here at PHRTC, and thank you very much for inviting me to this memorable event. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, international cooperation, including uh, uh, UPLB. And uh, I hope you enjoy my talk as much you, as you enjoy the food. Uh, I have 25 e years uh, experience in the field of uh, post harvest technology research. And uh, when I joined the research group, I was told that post harvest losses were 20 to 50 percent in uh, developing countries in uh, 19. Uh, 94. And according to the uh, famous book uh, published by UC Davis, they said uh, post service losses 20 to 50 percent in developing countries. Next. 20 years later, we still report post service losses uh, 20 to 50 percent. 20, 20 years difference, but there is no changes in post harvest loss over the past two decades. Is it very difficult to reduce post harvest loss? I don't think so. We can reduce post harvest losses. This is a common scenario in uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, all of you know what is the problem, such as frequent hand contact, careless sorting, overpacking, physical damage during transportation, and contamination. Next slide. You are expert on post harvest technology, so I'm not going to talk about these slides in detail. And a lack of post harvest infrastructure, such as proper loading, bumpy loads, no temperature management, unsanitary condition in markets, and careless management. That's why post harvest losses are high. Lack of post harvest technology and lack of post harvest infrastructure. Next slide. I will talk to you how we reduce the post harvest losses. We established post harvest infrastructure. Next slide. We also established a research group on post harvest technology. I am the uh, post harvest uh, uh, PHRTC because you have long experience, 40 years experience. But I'm the first generation in Korea who conduct research post harvest technology. We don't have long experience. When government established the packing house throughout Korea, government also established research group. Then government uh, invested in post harvest uh, technology research. And also, we encouraged the research group to communicate with industries. Even though we developed technology, no post harvest industry adopted the technology because big gap. So we tried to communicate with the industry. So, uh, we established the association and union, and uh, there is a very close relationship between research institutes and uh, post service industry. And also, we encourage the uh, post service industry to carry out loss reduction program. Okay, next slide. So the goal of Apache project, I'm uh, managing Apache project with certain African, uh, Asian countries. The goal is to reduce post service losses through development of manual and improved post harvest handling and application of the improved manual in industry. Next slide. OK, now I'm going to talk about uh, activities of the project. Oops. Sorry. We uh, developed a post harvest manual and to do that, first we selected three crops per countries. So each country selected three crops, including tomato. Then uh, we surveyed post-ups losses and uh, current post-ups handling. 
Then we considered what are solutions to improve the post office management. Uh, some country, they do not have exports. Here in Philippines, you have many exports. But some country, they do not have any exports on post office technology. They do not have any research unit dealing with post office uh, technology. That's why we need, need collaboration to share information. So we uh, do discussion to find the proper manual for each member countries. Then uh, we wrote model manual on improved post office handling. But the clients are farmers or industrial people. They do not want to read very difficult textbook. So we uh, developed a model manual using easy term and pictures for better understanding. After that, we translate the manual to their native language. All clients, uh, farmers, uh, industrial people, they are not good at English, so uh, we have translated the manual into their native language, so these are pictures of the manual. What is the next step? We developed the post office handling manual, but we are not sure the manual can be practically used in industry. So we are doing application of the manual in post office industry. To do that, we selected the crop and location, and we implemented the post office manual. Then we'll assess post office losses and uh, beneficial effect. Through that, uh, post ha harvest handling manual will be revised. We developed the manual. After application, we find the problems. Because if it costs a lot, the post office industry doesn't want to adapt the technology. So, the manual will be revised, and the manual or result can be used to improve post office systems in Apache member countries. After that, we'll assess post office losses of horticultural crops, and we'll measure losses uh, during supply chains, and uh, we'll use scientific uh, measuring method to uh, evaluate post types losses. Then we also uh, survey farmers' income, how much these projects uh, contribute to uh, income increase. After that, uh, we report the results and uh, we publish papers in journal. And uh, this is an example uh, when we reported the results at International Symposium. We we'll disseminate the post office handling manual uh, through training, workshop, and consultation. Now I'll tell you about outputs. Uh, through the projects, we uh, published the common manual, uh, and we published the 22 manual books uh, written in a local language, and poster leaflets, and etc. We found that uh, improved post tech, uh, technology reduced the losses of horticultural crops from this amount to this amount. Then it will be good source. Uh, for national strategy development on post office uh, technology. And we also uh, surveyed uh, income increase for farmers or post office industries. And during the uh, projects, uh, we disseminated the uh, technology, and each member countries, they hold training, uh, 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 training uh, to farmers or industrial peoples. And we made a joint slogan, reduce post office losses to feed more uh, people. And uh, we are using the slogans uh, through these things. And uh, we report the result through a conference like this. And future plan. Uh, we'll carry out the project in post office industry. Then uh, we'll find uh, practical uh, post service handling. Then uh, we'll uh, set up practical manual on post service handling and we'll uh, publish the manual written in local language. And we'll report the result of the second phase project, uh, application of the improved manual uh, to find the practical manual. Then we'll disseminate the practical manual to farmers who are Industry located in other area. 
We also survey uh, post types losses of horticultural crops with object measurement method. For example, uh, this is an example of national post types loss calculation of apple. We store apple for eight or nine months. Sometime, the post types losses is uh, the survey is done uh, within a couple of months from the harvest. If they survey post types losses of apple in Korea. They may report the post types losses of apple is 8%. But we store apples seven to nine months. When we survey uh, post types losses during this time, then post types losses will be 32%. A lot of big difference. So when we evaluate a post types losses, we should consider the storage period and also portion of storage distribution. In general, uh, consumers want to eat fresh apples, so they can consume the more apples within two or three months from harvest. So 55% of apples are consumed within two or three months. So when we uh, Report post types losses of apple in Korea. We should consider the storage period and uh, portion of storage period, uh, storage. So we need modified post types losses. After we find uh, post types losses and uh, the risks, then uh, we can find uh, the cause of losses and uh, find also solutions. Then it is better to let industries uh, establish a loss reduction program. Uh, they will set up action program and practice how to reduce post types losses uh, at the uh, post types stage by the target industry. So they will uh, find a solution to reduce the losses by themselves. We expect uh, post types industry will improve the uh, technology. So they will adapt to better, uh, better technology. And also, we hope the project can uh, increase in farmer's income through adoption of the manual in farming area. When we uh, reported uh, post types losses of horticultural crops in Asia, uh, in 2015, Many countries, they reported 25 to 45 percent losses. Many readers in a field of post harvest technology, they emphasize we needed to reduce post harvest losses. But nobody mentioned how many percentage we can reduce until when. So we need a specific target and specific uh, the target year. So through the project, we expect uh, we can reduce post types of losses after two, seven years. In Asian countries, our target goal is 20 to 40 percent post types of losses. No more 20 to 50 percent post types of losses. Through adoption of improved practical post types handling and use of scientific measuring method, uh, we can reach the goal. As Alan mentioned, I'm managing a project with the African countries. Uh, when we went to a packing house, uh, one uh, project member was involved in the packing house, and uh, we visited the packing house. There were four men. Uh, they were wondering if they can reduce the post types of losses. And one young guy, he said, yes, I can. And he was wondering how many percentage they can reduce post types losses. Gradually, we hope to reduce post types losses of horticultural crops. So I, I will show their face. <laughs> they are laughing and they say, they will reach the goal, you know? 
those countries, there is no export on post harvest technology, no research unit. Comoros, DR Congo, Cameroon, Zimbabwe, no any research unit. But they are learning post harvest technology, and they will trying to uh, they will try to establish research unit dealing with the post harvest technology. Then uh, they said they will reach the goal. Uh, so far, no export. Thank you for your attention, and I hope we also left a lot with post harvest loss reduction. Thank you very much, and salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Now our next speaker is uh, sharing us a view of an international partner, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, our next speaker is a senior enterprise development officer and team leader of the Global Save Food Initiative at the FAO headquarters in Rome, Italy. She has extensive experience working on post-harvest systems development in Asia and the Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Rosa S. Roll. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. First of all, I wish to congratulate the PHTRC on your 40 years of being real champions in post-harvest. Um, I have to acknowledge Dr. Elder, but she's not here. Um, but I met with Dr. Elder by sheer chance and accident. It was one day we were both attending a conference um, in Thailand and she missed her bus. And I said to her, why don't we just share the same bus? And we started talking. And then from then on, I have been working in collaboration with Dr. Elder, by extension with the PHTRC. And uh, we've had some really great interactions. And actually, what I will be presenting today, a lot of that work is actually supported by Dr. Elder and, uh, and her colleagues as well. OK, so um, do we have, a, is this a pointer here? OK. So I want to take a look at the regional context um, to put some things into perspective on why we're approaching the, our areas of work the way we do and what we are actually doing on the ground. So there's a lot of change taking place across the region in terms of um, marketing of fresh produce, a lot of interest, growth in the supermarkets, hypermarkets. We have a lot more in terms of the fast food sector, growth in tourism, hospitality sector, and uh, also export, growth in exports. And that is spurring a lot of demand for safety, for quality, better quality, and so um, modern value chain development. At the same time, we have to deal with uh, the traditional supply chains, which predominate, but these are the chains that are very important for the food security of the region because they supply a lot of the uh, food requirements of the mass market. And uh, this is where attention, is this one? Security requirements. So these chains are characterized, again, production push, very um, fragmented production units, lots of smallholders, the multi-layered channels moving from very various stakeholders, um, limited, very limited use of post-harvest technology, highly inefficient, um, and that's where we have the high levels of losses when we compare to what is happening in terms of the modern value chains that are supplying safe quality produce uh, to some of the um, better, to, to supermarkets, hypermarkets, and export. In terms of the levels of post-harvest losses in these traditional supply chains, um, the information and the data we have uh, from across the region shows that it's anywhere between 15 and 50 percent, depending on the type of uh, fresh produce item you're looking at. 
Now, some of the issues that we see in terms of uh, some of the um, various studies, some of the work we have done across the region, is that there is a need for attention in a number of different areas to address the issues. Um, first of all, it's important for the stakeholders to really become a little bit more aware. We heard Dr. Elder talking about that this morning, um, about what is happening in terms of um, the market requirements. Are they, what is the loss? What is considered a loss? This is an issue that many smallholders still cannot really grapple with. Um, again, the level of organization of the stakeholders much of the work that we are doing now in many countries, especially in this region, one of the key criteria is that you have working with an organized group of farmers because when you have smallholder farmers and individuals, it becomes very difficult to really build capacity and to help them to be able to access further support and development. The other area we have to address is pest infestations and diseases. Um, both at the farm level, but also to, to be able to arrest those problems in the post-harvest system. Um, harvest maturity is something that still needs a lot of attention, research, and we've been doing a lot of that in also in, our, in many of the projects that we're working on. The issue of transport losses due to improper, inadequate, bulk packaging, um, again, the issue of the level of post-harvest technology that is used or even the absence of it. Um, this morning we heard again from um, the uh, high-level representative of the government, the issue of extension support, very, very critical, but very lacking in most countries in the region. And the whole issue of infrastructure, basic infrastructure, and sometimes in many of our projects, you bring in a hot water tank, but the grid, electricity grid, in the rural areas cannot support the operation of that equipment. So, you know, basic things like electricity, uh, water, access to clean water, those are very important issues that require attention. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit more about how FAO has been supporting smallholders in traditional value chains in the region. And in this area, we have had very excellent support from PHTRC, particularly Dr. Elder and Dr. Serrano, as well as Dr. Domi, who's here. So, <coughs> um, a recent project conducted in South um, Asia, we were looking at um, specific uh, chains, supply chains, in three different countries, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. But I'll just highlight the issue of the traditional winter tomato supply chain. And the approach was to do, to look at what is happening in terms of a market survey, also conduct a CAP survey to understand the approach, the attitude, the thinking of the smallholders. And then to look at what is happening along the supply chain. And uh, one of the key bottlenecks is, that was observed is the whole issue of the transport losses, but it's largely due, the underlying cause is largely due to the packaging the type of packaging, but look at the quantity, 50 kilogram sacks. Of, and so um, one of the first things that was done is to look at what are the causes of losses, which were the packaging, the, also the approaches that are used by the smallholders, which is harvesting in this um, harvesting collection and then immediate packaging, no measure of you know, trimming of the stems, no washing, um, and again, the whole issue of how the, the, the sacks of the tomatoes are handled. 
Um, as I mentioned, transportation was a critical loss point in the supply chain. That's where you have the highest levels of loss, mainly due to compression damage. And that is largely due to, again, overpacking and uh, the inadequacy of the packaging. So, to us then, based on that information that we had, there was you know, some thinking around what would be the best and most appropriate approaches to be able to work with the smallholders based on all the information that had been collected. Because again, the approach is a very participatory one. It's not something that we just went in and brought in material, but to see based on the CAP survey and the market survey, what will work for that particular group. And so, um, with, after a number of discussions the part with, between Dr. Elder as well as with the partnering institution, which is Bari, Bangladesh Agricultural Research Unit, they came, came up with a strategic approach and a plan uh, that would help to improve the post-harvest practices in the supply chain to reduce losses. So one of these, some of the elements introduced will improve harvesting containers, um, trimming of the stems, washing, and then instead replacing the red pl plastic mesh sack with uh, 25 kilogram plastic crates. So in the process of introducing the, the improvements in the chain, again, participatory approach is taken to capacitate the stakeholders and using hands-on approaches. And these are the various steps. And what we also did in that process was to, when loading on, doing everything in parallel. So everything was done under the same conditions. So that would allow one to really compare the impact of improved practices. Another issue that was looked into were defining quality criteria. These are also very critical, very important. So um, to differentiate what constitutes a qualitative and an outright loss in the supply chain. And again, that is again used as a basis for identifying um, the, to, to be able to quantify the impacts of the, the new um, improvements that were introduced. So for the most part, as we said earlier on, you have a lot of loss due to compression. Of course, the qualitative produce that has suffered from qualitative loss can still be sold, but at a lower price. But when it's quantitative, um, due to cracks and uh, decay, of course, you, get, uh, you have to get, um, get rid of them. They're thrown away. That uh, constitutes a quantitative loss. Um, we're also looking at, um, but after the produce has gone, between, traveled from the farm to the market, what has been the impact? So we have also some of the researchers at, from Bari looking at the extent of the, and the causes of the losses that have taken place in the supply chain for both the traditional and the improved practices. So the sampling methodology uh, involved taking 10% by weight and looking at the, the comparing the two over time. And these are some of the results that we can see. If you look at the sack, I always say at the bottom, you don't have tomatoes anymore. You have juice. You can see it already falling off. But you can see the difference between the transportation in, uh, in the, the sacks versus the, cr the crates. If you look at what's there at the bottom, 30% of the tomatoes uh, sound at the bottom compared to 90% in the crates. So this is clear evidence that is 
very useful in convincing the stakeholders that you're working with on the importance of adopting improved and better practices. And here you can see we also look at um, the impacts of improving the packaging because again that's the type of information that's very useful after they've participated in all of the activities to help them to make decisions on whether or not they should adopt. You can see here with the crates you have 52% more of the sound fruit but not only you have a better quality fruit but also it has a better shelf life so again helping them to see the value of investing in and of adopting the improved practice. And then also the eco economic benefit for different types of stakeholders in the supply chain. Here I just showed the example of the benefit for the wholesaler. It's very interesting because initially um, we had one of the similar projects in Cambodia, for example, where you try to introduce um, the issue of the crates without giving any sort of background too much to any extent, economic background. And at the beginning, the stakeholders will say, no, it's, the bag is cheaper. But as soon as you can show them numbers like this where it, makes, it begins to make sense, especially the, the traders, it's something that they will pick up very quickly. And uh, they have, you know, many times if you go, when you go f and you initially talk about it and you go back, you already see people beginning to adopt the crates. <coughs> so apart from a lot of this work, FAO is also very actively involved in producing a lot of support materials because a lot of what is being done also we have prior to going into introducing a lot of the different technologies, we also do a lot of background work in terms of studies, in terms of workshops, in terms of trying to get perspective on what would work and what wouldn't work. And a lot of these materials also are made available in hard copy, but also they're online, easily accessible online. Um, again, a lot of the material is uh, produced in the local languages and is made available to the countries. We also produce in English and distribute uh, around as well in the different sub-regions. Uh, you can see some of this, most of this have actually been produced by Dr. Elder as well as Dr. Serrano, a lot of the material. So in conclusion, I think we need to realize that there are a number of factors when we are doing work in terms of uh, capacity building, a lot of extension support. Stakeholder awareness is very critical and very important. The other issue is that of building uh, core technical capacities. This is always something we start off, start off at the higher level by training trainers and then after training the stakeholders. Um, I just want to back up a little bit and all, um, to address the issue of awareness raising. Apart from you know, what we do in terms of engagement directly at the field level, FAO in 2013 also launched a Safe Food campaign. So this is one example of a poster where in the countries also, this is another area that we, um, FAO is working on in, under the Global Safe Food Initiative, where we actually generate and promote a lot of um, activities and awareness um, through various um, media and different mechanisms to ensure that we begin to stimulate and generate that interest because in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 12.3 calls for reducing post-harvest losses. And so FAO, as the custodian of the SDG 12.3 indicator, is monitoring 
what countries are doing toward that uh, end, and also supporting countries so that they can actually reduce the levels of losses. So a lot of what we have done has to be scaled up in order to, at the country level, so that they can actually show a reduction in, of loss as compared to that indicator. And some of the other requirements of success include, again, working, letting the stakeholders participate in the activities so that they can fully appreciate what, um, what needs to be done in a technical context, and also providing the stakeholders with information and evidence to help them to adopt the improved practice. For the introduction of crates, that was extremely important to, um, after every step, to, to actually go back and to show people the, the evidence in terms of the number, the recovery, but also the cost, because all of these things made a difference in terms of how receptive they were. So, <clears throat> essentially, what FAO is doing is trying to catalyze uh, through the technical cooperation to um, the, the, some of these types of changes. Uh, it's, I always say it's not rocket science, but it makes a big difference because um, you get something like in East Timor, we were able to reduce the tomato losses by 100%, in Cambodia by 86%, in Bangladesh by 97% in the supply chain for the smallholders. Um, and then we looked at, you know, I think in, it was in um, snap beans in the Sri Lanka by 60%, in Vietnam, bananas by 48%. It's not only the crates, but it's also the good practice. So I think if we can continue along these lines and to try to scale up, there's a lot of good potential to actually meet the Sustainable Development Goal target. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I just want to acknowledge again the support and the very excellent collaboration we have had with uh, Dr. Elder, Dr. Serrano, and also Dr. Uh, Domita Del Carmen in terms of uh, the work that we have done with them. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosaro, for sharing FAO UN's experience and uh, what uh, FAO is doing in uh, controlling or reducing the uh, post-harvest and food losses in the world. Now, let's hear it from our government funding agency. So our next speaker is the Acting Executive Director of the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources, Research and Development, PICARD. Department of Science and Technology, Philippines. He is also a research professor at the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, or Biotech, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He previously served as executive director of the DOS, the Philippine Council for Advanced Science and Technology Research and Development, now part of the Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development, PSHIR from 2005 to 2010. In 2010, he returned to UPLB and served as director of biotech UPLB until his appointment at Picard in February 2015. He obtained his bachelor's degree in agriculture, major in entomology and MS in entomology from the Univer University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He pursued his PhD in entomology at the Michigan State University in the USA as a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow. He also completed an international postgraduate university course in microbiology at the Osaka University in Japan, and his postgraduate studies as visiting fellow on intellectual property management and technology transfer at the International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications, a Mary Center, Department of Plant Breeding, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, USA. Friends, let us welcome Acting Executive Director of PICARD, 
Dr. Reynaldo V. Ebora. Uh, thank you. Magandang tanghali po sa ating lahat. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be discussing the capacity building effort of the Department of Science and Technology, particularly Picard, in the advancement of the horticulture industry. By the way, the, the information that we'll be presenting you will be possible without the help of Joy, Dr. Eusebio, and uh, uh, Lani, uh, my colleagues from Picard. Can I have the next slide, please? Maybe I'm not going to give you the discuss with you the data about the horticulture industry because you're maybe you're even more familiar than me with this particular information. But uh, what is more important here uh, are the challenges. This is the current production, and these are the challenges. And these are the one being addressed by R&D. So, for example, it's pests and diseases, poor nutrition, post-harvest losses for access to modern varieties and production inputs, inefficient marketing and distribution systems, and food safety issues on pesticide residues in fruits and vegetables. So most of the projects being funded by the government are actually addressing these particular concerns. Can I have the next slide, please? In Picard, we usually uh, approach the, those problems by having the so-called Industry Strategic s and Program, or ISPs. For those of you who have submitted research proposal to Picard, probably you're very familiar with asking very specific question in relation to the industry. And uh, the ISPs that we have are aligned with the harmonized national R&D agenda covering the period 2017 to 2022. And that particular ISPs are actually crafted in consultation with the National Academy of Science and Technology through the Agricultural Sciences Division uh, headed by uh, Dr. Emil Javier. And this is also aligned with the uh, Philippine Agriculture 2020. If you are going to group, oh, sorry. If you are going to group the different concerns being addressed by the ISPs in general, there are three main concerns. One is increased yield and income of farmers, reduce pest infestation and incidence of disease, and reduce post harvest losses. So if you are going to see the ISPs, they are actually starting, uh, if you have the value chain, starting from the planting materials to uh, post-harvest and then the processing. And we have to look at the gaps where s and inversion intervention can, can have impact. I think I have to have a training in how to use this. <laughs> this is just an example of a, a roadmap that we have for the crops and uh, I would like to draw your attention to the different projects that are lined up. Actually, this has to be updated because we have uh, funded additional projects in 2017 and there are a lot that are already online for, uh, in, in 2018. And basically, in here, we have uh, a certain target for a certain commodity and uh, we have to look at the intervention that we, have, that we are going to do. And um, he, by having that intervention, you have to identify the institutions that are going to do the research. In general, we have uh, several types of R&D efforts. Uh, some of those are the so-called, uh, you know, you, we uh, have a call for proposal, and then the researchers will submit their proposal, and we select what are the best uh, uh, proposal to address a particular problem. The other thing is the so-called solicited proposal, wherein we have a very specific topics uh, that uh, we offer to the researchers to work on. And the third one is commissioned research, wherein we have prescribed the methodologies and uh, the cooperation that should be done with other agencies so that they can work on that particular uh, research area. So those are the different type of arrangement. And uh, our industry strategic s and programs are, can be grouped in the following R&D areas, biotechnology, both uh, traditional and uh, quite advanced, such as genomics, uh, varietal improvement, production of quality planting materials, cultural management, value chain analysis, pest and disease management, post-harvest handling, processing, and impact assessment. 
uh, in all of the projects that we are funding, not only for horticulture-related projects, we put emphasis on impact assessment. So immediately after, uh, immediately after having the results or after the end of the project, our socioeconomic research division is conducting an impact assessment studies. And most of the studies are actually being conducted here in UPLB with the Department of Economics and Management. In, in our case, uh, the USD Picard as a funding agency, we rely heavily on RDIs or Research and Development Institutes institution and higher education institutes, which are basically uh, most, most of the time SUCs in the region and also with the help of the industry. And so in order for, for us to have impact, we really have to capacitate these RDIs and HCIs. And by, when we may capacit, uh, in, increasing their capacity, capacity in terms of human resources and at the same time improving the infrastructure. This is the uh, DUST Picard Regional Consortia. As of now, we have 14. We have revitalized the, the engagement with the regional consortia in, 19, in 2015. And basically, these uh, consortia are tasked to identify regional priorities aside from the national priorities that are already funded by Picard. And they will be given additional resources so that the regional priorities can be addressed. So in, in some cases, there seems to, seems to be a duplication of effort, but actually it is not because it's an intended duplication. So that means if a particular crop is being handled by a certain consortium, however, uh, a field trial, for instance, is to be done in another area covered by another consortium, then duplication is necessary. But we are avoiding unnecessary duplication. So, if we are going to do uh, capacity building, capacity building is basically needed on, on these uh, three aspects. One is in human resources, in, in uh, capability to do R&D, and improvement of infrastructure and equipment in order to achieve the intended target. In human resources, what we have realized is our bench is quite shallow in terms of our having our researchers. Uh, as indicated by Senator Villar, the funding situation in the Department of Science and Technology has improved a little bit as compared to the previous years, but the absorptive capacity of our research institution is quite low. Even if you have sufficient funds, it cannot be absorbed by the implementing agency. And one of the problem is actually, one of the problems is actually administrative in nature. I think you will agree with me, procurement is one. We have released the funding and it took a lot of time just to purchase a very simple equipment. And uh, it has delayed the R&D effort, uh, not only in UPLB, but also in other uh, universities. In the case of human resources, we are focusing on uh, our capacity to have, to have uh, researchers that can actually do laboratory research and field research at the same time, and who can actually do uh, extension. In, in our case, our R&D work actually have a component on R&D results utilization. And most of the project is either community-based or farm-based, the so-called SNT-based farm or SNT community-based farm, which is uh, actually an extension in nature. For human resources, most of the airports are basically on these areas. One is short-term. And in this case, we require that it is embedded in the R&D grant. So, for example, uh, you want to have some training in certain aspect of the technology, and if you can do it by having part of uh, a consortia or consortium, then short-term training can be done that way. The other thing is retooling. Uh, and uh, we found this very useful because most of the researchers that are relatively advanced in age, don't want to obtain the formal degree anymore, but they are very willing to do retooling. So for example, uh, they, you, they can do molecular biology work if they are trained as a basic microbiology person or the other way around. The other thing is the graduate training in MS and PhD program and uh, postgraduate training. For the graduate training, this is uh, a lot of uh, 
arrangement, it can be done. You have the so-called sandwich program, wherein you're going to obtain your degree, for example, here in UPLB, and you're going to do your thesis or dissertation in another university abroad. We have done that uh, for several uh, graduate students and found it very useful because after obtaining the degree, they already have established connection with the foreign university and they can do the actual research. And this is what we have experienced, for example, in bio nanotechnology. Uh, wherein, uh, after returning from their uh, PhD, they were able to submit proposal to Picard and it was immediately funded. And they can develop uh, products and technologies out of that dissertation. And as, as of now, in the Department of Science and Technology, capacity building in terms of graduate scholarship is administered by the Science Education Institute through two major programs, the Accelerated Science and Technology Human Resources Development Program and the Engineering Research and Development for Technology. If you're going to look at the different scholarships that were given, a lot of these are actually related to horticulture. Uh, you will be surprised. The, and then uh, Picard has recently launched a program called GREAT. And this is a graduate research and education assistantship for technology. We are hoping that next time we can make it greater. But essentially, this particular program is that SEI will give a scholarship to, uh, for MS and PhD, and uh, Picard will provide the research grant to that particular student. And he, will be give, he or she will be given an additional amount. So this is just like a premium scholarship. Because you have a research grant, you have additional stipend, on top of your regular scholarship. And uh, this is actually based on the principle of mentorship. And I would like to thank Dr. Laude, actually, uh, who helped us to develop this program. Uh, we have started this in 2015, I think. I have been discussing with them about this program. And uh, we were able to implement it, it uh, last year. So as of now, we have 16 uh, graduate students under this particular program. We are hoping to have additional, a total for this program actually is 25. So we still have additional slots. But the main idea is people who will be graduating from this program will be given research grant almost automatically by Picard. When I say almost automatically, it doesn't mean that it will not be evaluated. It will be evaluated, but a special consideration will be given to them so that they will be able to establish their track, stress rec, uh, track record uh, uh, very fast, because we have noted that uh, our researchers in the Philippines are actually not enough. Even if you have a lot of resources, you will not be able to do the research because you don't have the people. And with this program, hopefully they are going to, uh, to graduate at the same time, then we have additional 16 researchers in various areas. And uh, aside from this, I, uh, uh, Dean Supanko is not here anymore, but uh, it is a challenge for him actually, because we were able to get a grant from the DUST providing eight foreign scholarships to College of Agriculture. And uh, we have already identified the students, but unfortunately, they don't have the admission yet from foreign universities, so that's why we have to wait. And we are hoping the resources are already available this year, but it seems that it will not be possible because they don't have the admission yet, so maybe we have to delay that next year. But the idea is uh, we would like to have an impact so that people that are trained in, uh, in foreign universities will go back at the same time, they will have impact. Because we are given choices, are we going to distribute these slots in different SUCs? But I said probably it's not the wise thing to do it because you are basically scattering the resources and there might be no impact. So we are hoping that the eight slots that were given to the uh, College of Agriculture foreign scholarship will be availed by the college so that we will be able to package another grant. Uh, and it will be the same for other universities later. So it's just a matter of uh, packaging the program because resources are available. If we will not be able to utilize the resources, I think it's our fault. Because the Senator Beller has said the funding situation has improved and I think management of those resources should also improve. The other thing is the Balik Scientist Program, and I think you are very familiar with this. Basically, we are tapping the expertise of our uh, Filipino scientists and researchers that are based abroad, 
and willing to help the R&D efforts of the country. And there are the two arrangements, either short-term or long-term. And uh, under the Balik scientists, they usually work with the host institutions and work with the special, uh, specific projects. Or in, or in some cases, just helping uh, the institution to make uh, 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 an R&D plan that will be implemented later. And we are having some good results on this because uh, some of the Balik scientists were able to mentor students, graduate students, that, that they have uh, hosted in their lab and they were able to obtain the, their degree here in the Philippines under a sandwich program. We have some uh, examples of this, uh, especially of those from uh, Michigan State University under Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alucelha. Then uh, the DOST has launched a new program now, the so-called Science for Change, or S4C program. And this is an accelerated R&D program for capacity building of R&D, of RDIs and industrial competitiveness. There are four sub-programs and their particular S4C program. One is NICER, RD Lead, Cradle, and BIS. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, its program later. But uh, NICER is basically a neat center in the regions for R&D. So you have to identify institutions of higher uh, HEI and RDIs in the region to improve the R&D infrastructure. But the condition is they have to have an ongoing research project or R&D effort, and they're going to identify additional two more that will be supported by the department. Uh, in the case of the DOST, this is being administered through the different councils, through Picard for Agriculture and Aquatic Concerns, for Industry and Development for Pichard, and for help for the PCHRD. And the established R&D centers will cater to specific needs of the region. And uh, this is intended to promote inclusive growth by increasing the number of developed and transfer technologies and improve the level of IP management and protection. This is more or less similar to the comment of Dr. Dr. Kisumbing about the hot water treatment technology. Because if that particular technology was patented and it was imposed, probably royalty can be given to the university. The RD Leads uh, Leadership, uh, RD R&D Leadership Program, or RD Lead, is actually a twin program of needs. So, for example, if there are some experts in other countries, either Filipino or foreigner, and you need the expertise, they can be hired to uh, basically serve as a mentor in a net center. And of course, the salary, they have to pay them with the salary that they're getting in their place of origin. So this is a special type of program and uh, it engages experts from Philippines and abroad to strengthen research capabilities of HAI and RDIs and perform the following. Lead in establishing new or upgrading existing R&D centers under NICER, train and capacitate local researchers, faculty and students, and provide policy recommendation. So this is basically, uh, you identify an expert and bring it to the Philippines and request them to work in a, special, uh, a specific center. The other one is collaborative R&D to liberate Philippine economy or cradle, and it, is, uh, it aims to invigorate the Philippine uh, R&D. This is more of a private academic uh, collaboration. In this particular case, the industry is the one identifying the problem, and then they have to approach certain HEI uh, 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 or RDI to work on that particular problem. And uh, we, have, we have recently approved uh, one project under this particular scheme wherein a banana plantation is willing to use their banana plantation as a study site to monitor the disease incidents. And there's a university that is willing to provide the technology and test the system that they have. So in this case, the industry is the one who identified the problem. You have the university is willing to handle the particular experiment and then uh, the fund is given by the DOST to the university, not, not to the uh, private sector. So it's an indirect way of helping the private sector. Then that's, uh, the other modification of this particular program is a so-called uh, Cradle 2, which is a product development with joint funding for the development of commercial application and products. 
So that means if a certain products or product or technology will be developed, DOST will be giving the fund to the SUC or SEI, and the industry will be giving their own fund, and they're going to work on one research project. And the intellectual property will be defined from the very beginning so that once the product is developed and IP is developed, the sharing is well defined and there will be no problem. The, for, at this time, there's no application yet for this particular uh, program, but we already have several on this uh, so-called Cradle One. And one example that I have uh, mentioned is the one with the banana plantation. The last program is the Business Innovation Through S&T for Industry Program. And this particular program is, uh, it facilitates the acquisition of strategic and relevant technologies by Filipino companies for immediate incorporation and their R&D acti activities. So for example, if a certain company needs certain technology that is not available in the country, that particular, can, uh, the DOST can help them to acquire that particular technology. And then uh, they provide financial assistance. This is for Filipino company, usually SMS, S, not SMS, SME, <laughs> similar to what was mentioned by uh, Senator Villar and provides financial assistance to private companies to undertake R&D. It enhances the capacity of private companies by acquisition of high-tech equipment and machineries, technology licensing and patent rights. For example, if a certain company needs certain technology but it's covered by patent, under this particular arrangement, they can actually pay for the patent rights so that it can be used by that company. But after the uh, product is developed and uh, the objective of the project has been attained, then the company has to return the resources to the DUST. So parang pinahiram yung resources so that they will, they will be able to do the R&D and develop the technology and afterwards they have to pay without any interest. So as of now, wala pa rin pong applicant ito. Uh, we have a lot of uh, applicants and process a lot of application all, already for NICER and Cradle, but at this time, we don't have applicant for this. Uh, primarily, the applicant for this should be SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And aside from that, uh, Picard has a uh, regular program, the DOST Picard Facility Development for Narden. In 2017, we have funded uh, a lot of uh, upgrading of laboratories, but only two are related to horticulture. And this is in Nueva Ecija, uh, Nueva Biscaya, State University Crops and Soils Analytical Services Lab, and the one in UP Mindanao, the Coconut Tissue Culture Laboratory. Oops, sorry. For, uh, I, I just would like to emphasize that <clears throat> it is very, very important to have international linkages. And uh, one of the very successful co collaboration that we have is with Asia. Uh, with their uh, different programs, one of which is the horticulture program. It is because you will be able to get expertise from outside and at the same time you can uh, uh, develop a relationship wherein you can top the expertise anytime you want. It is, just like, it is just like having friendship that after the project, even the project has ended, you still have uh, linkages that you can, you know, if you need help, you can top uh, the expertise from those people. And then you have, we have a very good uh, example also with TARI, the Taiwan Agricultural Research Institute. And uh, we are all actually encouraging our uh, network to look at possibilities in working with them because they're very active. And also with Korea, they have a very good uh, working relationship with, uh, uh, with the Philippines and through the different projects fund, uh, being monitored by Picard under the Rural Development uh, Administration and some projects under the USAID for international development, US, United States Agency for International Development. So what I would like to say is considering the, the different needs of the R&D community, I think it's very important for us to work together. Because even if we have, there are a lot of uh, resources in terms of money, if the administrative support is not there, you will have a lot of problems. So for instance, in the government, if you are given your uh, research fund that you have requested for the year, 
you make sure that you will be able to spend all of your fund by the end of the year. If not, you will be in big trouble. Uh, because, for example, if you have requested 100 pesos from the government, at the end of the year, you're only able to spend 50, you are have a trouble for that 50 pesos remaining. And probably that's the reason why I have less hair in my head now, because of that particular uh, fund utilization. The other thing is, once you submitted proposals to us and it is funded, make sure that you will be able to deliver the results. Because uh, if, if for those of you who are familiar with the system of the DOSD, you have the so-called six P's. Patent, publication, partnership, and ano pa ba yung Products, <laughs> policy. And, uh, that means for every peso that we have invested in a particular R&D effort, there should be a corresponding output. It's a value for money proposition. And that's why uh, what, what we are saying now is, we should be able to have the resources, we should be able to have the people, we should be able to have the infrastructure. If we have the three at one time, probably we will be, will be able to have an impact uh, in terms of developing products and technologies. And, 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 and I, at this point, I would like to thank UPLB, although we have a lot of problems in processing uh, the memorandum of agreement with, your, with the university, but uh, you know, UPLB is delivering a lot of technologies that are product of our R&D, and, and we are very thankful to UPLB. I hope I will not be recalled because of that statement. <laughs> Again, thank you, and magandang tanghali po. Thank you, Dr. Ebor, for sharing with us all this information ready for taking. So what uh, DOS is doing to help build capacity through research programs, and then you have scholarships, uh, there's a lot. And now, again, another government agency. So a view from the Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Agricultural Research. And the last speaker for this panel discussion is Ms. Cynthia Remedios V. De Guia. She is the DA Bureau of Agricultural Research OIC Budget Officer, and concurrently holds the position of Assistant Head of the Program Development Division. She spearheads the preparation of the Bureau's physical and financial plan, and the periodic reportorial requirements to oversight agencies. She likewise provides critical support in overseeing the planning and policy and project evaluation functions of PDD and spearheads the formulation of the national and the climate change RDE agenda and programs as well as orchestrates its consolidation and implementation. So Ms. De Guia attended and participated various seminars, conferences, and workshops related to the Philippine agriculture and fisheries R&D and strengthen linkages with different development partners. She also has a continuing interest in sustainable community-based agricultural development, climate resilient development planning, and in agriculture and fisheries R&D governance within the innovation systems context. Ms. De Guia holds a Master of Science degree in Animal Science and a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, both from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and she's currently pursuing her doctorate degree in Public Administration at the National College of Public Administration and Governance, NCPAG, of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And to present to you our speaker for this panel discussion, Ms. Cynthia Remedios, V. De Guia. Magandang magandang tanghali po sa ating lahat. This will be very, very short talag din po, considering na lunchtime na din po tayo. In behalf of Director Nico Medes Eliazar, again, I'm Cynthia De Guia or Chai De Guia from the Program Development Division. And I will be presenting the DA Bar R&D Priorities for Post-Harvest Horticulture. Very briefly po, Bar, DA Bar is a staff bureau of the Department of Agriculture. We serve as the National Coordinating Agency for Agriculture and Fisheries Research and Development of the Department of Agriculture with the mandate of ensuring that all agricultural researches are undertaken for maximum utility to agriculture and with a vision of a better life for Filipinos through excellence in agriculture and fisheries research and development and a mission of attaining food security and reducing poverty through technology-based agriculture and fisheries sector. 
this is our current operational framework to which we are supporting um, basic research, applied research, community-based participatory action research, and also technology commercialization. These are our research modalities, and also we are also um, have support with the knowledge management and institutional development. For institutional development, it's quite similar with the degree and non-degree support of DOST Picard and all of these modalities and research support that we have for the researchers and the R&D system are contributory to the current objectives and goals of the Department of Agriculture, which is increasing availability and affordability of food, increasing income of farmers and fisher folk, and the third objective of increasing resilience to climate change risk. These are our R&D programs, which are already mentioned, the CIPAR, the TECCOM, uh, NTCP, which are our banner programs. We also have support to basic and strategic research, as mentioned, the institutional development, knowledge management, ICT, and also research policy advocacy. As a staff bureau of the Department of Agriculture, we are also managing the R&D funds of the national banner programs of the DA, which are the commodity-based programs for the rice, corn cassava, corn and cassava, high-value commercial crops, poultry and livestock, with particular emphasis with the uh, native animals, and also fisheries and agriculture. We are also managing the R&D funds of the DA in terms of its thematic programs for organic agriculture, climate change, biotechnology, and also on food safety. For the priority commodities of the ABAR, it's quite extensive. Um, and it is categorized according to the industry groupings of the Philippine Council for Agriculture and Fishery, another attached agency of the Department of Agriculture. So under the food stables and feed sources, and also other alternatives, dito po pumapasok yung ating rice, corn, cassava, and also uh, other alternative food staples like adlai. For the commercial crops, plantation and biofuel, vegetable legumes and root crops, and fruits. Dito na po pumapasok yung mga horticultural produce po natin. And also again, for poultry and livestock, the native and the backyard animals, and the aquaculture and the capture fisheries. Narrowing to the emphasis of today's activity, we are also recognizing that 45%, along with the roots and tubers, fruit and vegetables have the highest wastage rates of any food products. Almost half of all the fruit and vegetables produced are wasted. There are already a lot of information discussed by the previous speakers speaking the importance of the food losses and also its implication on food security. And what's alarming is that um, in the developing countries, majority of these food losses occur in the post-harvest post post and processing stages, while in the industrial uh, countries, food losses mostly occur in the consumer and the retail stages. Having this emphasis and also recognizing the importance of uh, these food losses and how it affects food security, we have the research, uh, this research development and extension agenda and programs. We call that RDAP, the National RDAP and the Climate Change RDAP of which this was um, formulated through multi-stakeholder consultations. And in order to ensure that we would not be able to, we would not be able to miss and mostly focus only on the production aspect of the whole supply chain, the emphasis, the researchable areas indicated in these reference documents that we provide to our R&D partners includes the, in the problems in the researchable areas that needs to be addressed for the input stage, the production, processing and distribution, the post-harvest, marketing, and up to the consuming stage, stages. As stated in the two RDAP, the climate change RDAP and also for our national RDAP, specifically for the fruits and vegetables, the goal is focused on increased consumption. World Health um, Organization recommendation for the per capita consumption of the fruits and vegetables is around 146 kilograms per year. But according to the statistic that we have, the Philippines only has 22%, uh, sorry, 22 kilograms uh, per year per capita consumption. Even if it would be combined with 
tubers, root crops, and nuts, that the, the figure would only raise up to 51 kilograms per year. Masyado pa pong mababa. Kaya for the Department of Agriculture, one of the emphasis really, particularly for the vegetable subsector, is to focus on increased consumption and also enhance quality and food safety and also efficient production resulting sustainable livelihood and enterprises. For the fruit, fruit subsector naman po, it focuses mostly on increase in income and also creating livelihood opportunities. For the R&D priorities that are indicated in the 2RD app, it would be very common to see this following, the following. Appropriate post-harvest technologies and system, the need to come up with processing technologies and also the processed products, efficient and cost-effective handling, storage system and extension of shelf life, improvement of raw material handling for processing, and also and value-added products specifically for food supplement. We actually have a number of projects that, have, uh, that are supported in, in line or in the context of post-harvest um, uh, stages. We, meron din po kami dito sa Filmec, meron po kami sa PHTRC, and a number of different R&D uh, implementing agencies nationwide. Specifically din po, this PHTRC, the establishment of this and the upgrading of the facilities, we have also supported din po ito. We have also supported din po. Okay, so these are some of the projects that we have. And actually po, every year, um, 25 to 30% of our budget is focused on the support for post-harvest technologies. In terms of the capacity building in advancing the horticulture industry, as mentioned by FAO, capacity building focuses on a series of actions directed at helping participants in the development process to increase their knowledge, skills, and understanding, and to develop the attitudes needed to bring about the desired developmental change. Given already the, given already the recognition and also the many things that this center have already achieved and contributed to the sector, you are actually in the position to do more, particularly in addressing the different uh, challenges post, particularly to the post-harvest um, the post-harvest stages of the food system. And in here, in developing countries, as already mentioned po kanina, Food waste and losses occur mainly at the early stages of the food value chain and can be traced back to the financial, managerial, and technical constraints in harvesting techniques as well as storage and cooling facilities. These have already been mentioned time and again by most of the speakers. Strengthening the supply chain through the direct support of farmers and investments in infrastructure, transportation, as well as an expansion of the food and packaging industry could help reduce the amount of food loss and waste. And for BAR, congratulations to your, to your anniversary. Congratulations to everything that you have achieved. And we would be continuing to support demand-driven post-harvest researches to come up with post-harvest technologies as it is aligned with the thrust and priorities of the Department of Agriculture. That's all po. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Ms. Degia. And now we are inviting our four speakers to sit in front for, our, uh, the uh, for this panel discussions open forum. And we will also would like to call on Dr. Ophelia K. Bautista to help us moderate this open forum. Dr. Bautista is a former PhDRD, PhDRC director and retired professor. We have had a very good presentations from our national and international partners, and we'd like to thank them for their participation in this program. Initially, we are very thankful to Australia for the establishment of the, our building, and now we are, would like to thank DA Bar for the establishment of this annex building. <laughs> However, we would like 
to thank also our international partners, as well as our other national partners, for all the uh, help that they have given us in order to come to this point of our uh, 40th anniversary. We have had the very good uh, interactions with, uh, with Dr. Kim and his group, and Dr. Roll, and uh, we have had very good support from Picard. Thank you very much to all of you. Okay, now we would uh, in, like to entertain comments or uh, questions from the group regarding their presentations. Any? Ah, uh, yes, okay. Good morning po. Kay Dr. Ibora po. Uh, yung tungkol po sa BIST. Uh, bukas, ako po sa papaya industry, si Ramon Manansala po. Mm, bukas po yung first harvest namin para sa first shipment namin, export sa Korea po. Ang problema po ang talaga namin is we, we don't have the v, VHT equipment. Uh, so, ang ginagaw, gagawin po namin is uh, we bring our products to Davao then sa Sa Diamond Star po kami mag, magpapa VHT. So maybe one of these days lalapit kami sa inyo, sir. Uh, Alam po. Uh, we encourage you to, uh, to write us and, and uh, basically just describe the, the present situation so that we will be able to package the proposal for the BIS because we have not handled any proposal yet for the particular program. Uh, the different uh, uh, actual mechanism still has to be uh, further improved uh, because this is the first time that we'll be providing direct support to the private sector under a different scheme. And so it will help us a lot if you, are going, if you are can send us a request describing the, the needs and then, uh, most probably, it will be the group of Joy who will be helping you in developing the proposal. Because it's also a proposal-driven system. But I hope that uh, you can send it to us as early as possible because our resources are still available. Maybe you're aware that uh, we have to use the resources by December. And usually, we have to close the books by uh, middle, all, uh, the last quarter of November. So if you can send us the request, that will be better, so that can, we can make the appropriate action. Anybody else? Uh, would somebody from PHCRC like to comment on the VHT? Doctor, Doctor Rebo. Doctor Esguera is here. VHT is vapor heat treatment for the disinfestation of the fruit. Yeah, uh, this is a vapor heat treatment is a quarantine treatment uh, that is required if you are going to export to Australia, Korea, uh, New Zealand, Japan. Japan no? uh, but uh, we have to consider several factors if you want to have your own vapor heat treatment facility. First, you have to seek the approval of the Japanese, if it is for Japan or Korea, uh, that you will have your own facility because uh, in the case of the importing countries, the Japanese or the Korean quarantine officers are detailed. Uh, they will be detailed in the uh, facility just like uh, what Dole, Del Monte, Diamond Star is doing and you have to pay them for because they will be the ones to to insert the probe on the fruit no just to seek and uh, the facility itself no if you it should be uh, sustainable it should be fully utilized for it to be economically viable in the case of your group so if you have a, a group of or association or co-op that you think that the facility can be fully utilized then go ahead with it. No? And also, uh, if you intend to export and use the facility, 
be sure that you can meet the volume, the quality requirement of the importing country, the timeliness of delivery of the product for it to be sustainable. Because if Korea, if you will uh, pursue with this uh, target of directly the, the group directly exporting to Korea, no, they will require certain volume and quality. So be sure that you can meet the weekly, for example, weekly shipment. No? And that will make the uh, utilization of the vapor heat treatment facility uh, fully operational and economically viable. Because you have to consider not only the technical feasibility, but also the economic viability of the uh, vapor heat treatment. Now, Diamond Star is providing uh, tolling services for the use of their facility in Davao. So initially, and then you make a full study, and then uh, the OST, uh, Dr. Ebora said that they have funds, but be sure to do it quickly, <laughs> the proposal. No, so those, those are the considerations no, in the vapor heat uh, treatment uh, requirement. So it's not only for papaya, you can uh, also uh, use it for mango. Of course, in Tupi, in South Cotabato, you have big areas there of papaya. In fact, Diamond Star, even Dole, Sumifru, they have their own, they have their plantations already in Tupi, South Cotabato for papaya. That's where papayas are coming from, those that we export. Ramon is our uh, uh, collaborator in the papaya project funded by HR. And uh, uh, he is uh, serving as a service provider. He built his own packing house facility, his own hot water treatment through his own initiative, not through funding from Asia. We just provided technical assistance to Mr. Manansala. That's why we invited him also to share uh, our <laughs> assistance to him. So that's, uh, that's, that should be considered Ramon. Ano? Anybody else would like to ask a question? Dr. Luella. <laughs> Comment lang po doon sa VHT. Kasi uh, sa Davao, may VHT din ang Panabo, yung Dole. They have two units there. We visited this for mango and papaya. So if you have volume that would be able to sustain the... Uh, acquisition or the establishment of this VHT, it's good because um, and in, uh, in Bukidun also, they requested a storage facility but now it's, it's a standby, it's, it's not used. So VHT, for example, at Diamond Star, I conducted my dissertation there, so they have 22 tons uh, capacity for one VHT. And uh, this is uh, this requires a uh, personnel from from the importing countries or the importing countries to be there, because for example, uh, you have to come up with 46 degrees centigrade of temperature, maintain it for 15 minutes, then shower it. By the time that your uh, probe on the um, uh, fruit reaches 46 degrees centigrade, the inspector of the importing country should be there to see to it that this uh, treatment is accomplished. Now, it costs a lot. And if uh, the volume of your contractors, or if you are consolidating your product, how much is it, how, what is the volume of your product? How, what is the frequency of your treatment? So it costs a lot. And if you could not sustain the quantity to be treated, there will be a standby uh, unit, and it costs a lot. And uh, maybe you can just avail of the services of Diamond Star. I used, I, I also availed of the Diamond Star, but this is at Tagig, at ano, at FTI, no. But uh, Dole has two, and maybe they they could ano, they could share uh, for for your ano for your uh, first uh, shipment maybe, because 
it is a trial and error and if you could not uh, come up with the corresponding volume and frequency of production to be able to uh, export, then you could not sustain the facility. Then it costs a lot. Hmm? Thank you, Dr. Cabajo. Uh, Dr. Protasio? Uh, congratulations, first of all, to Post Harvest on their 40th uh, anniversary. Uh, um, my, my question actually is for our international partners. Um, well, I, I heard the, uh, from Ms. Rolly about the um, tremendous reductions in post harvest losses in other ASEAN countries. I would just like to know if um, what to what can you attribute if or is there any contribution of PHTRC to to those uh, accomplishments in that field of reducing uh, losses? Was, was there anything that uh, uh, PHTRC uh, contributed in that in that? I know. Thank you. Yes, uh, we've been working quite a lot with Dr. Elder. That's our right-hand uh, post-harvest expert in a lot of the, the different um, projects that we have been implementing both in the GMS countries as well as um, in uh, South Asia. So yes, we have done quite a bit um, in Dr. Elder introduced some of the hot water treatment. Um, yeah, PHDRC is a, a, a key collaborator um, in terms of FAO's work in horticultural chains in the region. Maybe we'd like to hear also yeah. from Dr. Kim. Okay, um, among uh, certain APAS member countries, uh, uh, I'm sure Philippines is the leading countries to share information and technology and to also uh, teach other uh, countries to run uh, more post harvest technology. So, uh, the Philippines, actually uh, the project is done uh, by PHRTC and uh, Dr. Nuevo uh, is uh, contributing to uh, do reduce, uh, to to reduce post harvest losses, and uh, how much we uh, could reduce the losses. Actually, that is the, the data is the uh, pilot application. That data cannot cover all uh, post harvest losses of the uh, nation. But uh, uh, as we disseminate the technology to other area and throughout the countries, and uh, we hope we can reduce post harvest losses. But data is just. Uh, from uh, parallel application. Thank you. You can see that uh, you can see how involved the post harvest uh, center is uh, in all these uh, activities. In fact, we could not even cope up with uh, all the requests because uh, the number of personnel has decreased from. Uh, by almost a hundred percent from the time we were established. So with all the requests and with all the technologies that we need to develop and all the extension work that uh, the government would like us to do, we could hardly cope. So I wish the uh, university officials were here so they could hear our, our uh, <laughs> grievance, <laughs> if you can call it grievance so that we can uh, really do much more than what we are doing right now. Uh, Dr. Nuevo? Okay, in connection with what Dr. Kim has just stated, and I'm glad to uh, tell you that one of our partners in the industry is Alter Trade doing uh, some, uh, we are doing with them post-harvest handling of organic bananas. So they are here with the President Dr. Hilda and then Ray and just to acknowledge
Anybody else would like to uh, ask some questions or to give a comment? Oh, you're all hungry. <laughs> it's almost one o'clock. Okay, okay, then uh, let us thank our speakers uh, for this morning's session. But before that, we would like to acknowledge or appreciate the presence of our speakers here. So we will be awarding plaque of appreciation to our speakers. So may we call in Dr. Eldes Guerra and uh, the Associate Dean for Research and Extension of College of Agriculture and Food Science, Dr. Jocelyn uh, Labios, to award the plaque of appreciation to our guest speakers. So the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center presents this plaque of appreciation to Dr. Ji Gang Kim, for sharing invaluable wisdom and expertise as guest speaker on its 40th anniversary, given on the 27th day of October 2017 at the Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, College of Agriculture and Food Science, UP Los Baños. Signed, Dr. Elda B. S. Guerra, Director, PhDRC. Thank you, Dr. Kim. The same plaque will be given to Dr. Rosa S. Rowe. Dr. Reynaldo V. Ebola. And Ms. Cynthia de Medios V. De Guia. All right, so let's give a round of applause for our guest speakers. So before we take our lunch break, I would, like, I would just like to remind everyone who needed a uh, certificate of appearance, you can claim them at the registration booth, but make sure that you have uh, filled out the evaluation form. And to those who have ordered uh, souvenir items, you can also claim them at the registration booth. Okay? So... We will be back at around 1.45 for the next panel discussion this afternoon. So let's have a networking lunch. Okay, networking lunch, everybody. So see you this afternoon. 1.45.